The Soviet Union, and later its internationally recognized successor state, the Russian Federation, have long prided themselves on their tank forces. Russia has the world's largest armada of tanks, with a total of 12,566 units in its fleet. This is a number greater than the combined total of North Korea, 6,645, and the United States, 5,500, which come in at second and third place, respectively. So with all this pride about its supposed tank prowess, why has it been so reluctant to deploy its latest and greatest tanks to the battlefields in Ukraine? We all know about Russia's refusal to deploy its few T-14 Armata tanks into battle in Ukraine. It's afraid of losing them. However, Russia has also been hesitant to send its T-90s into combat too, and it's deployed comparatively few of them in Ukraine. Why? Is the T-90 also a tank that doesn't live up to the stories that the Russians have told about it? Or was the T-90 a marketing gimmick all along? Let's take a look at the T-90, Russia's supposedly most advanced main battle tank that it possesses in large numbers and its less than stellar performance in combat. Russia's fleet of over 12,500 tanks is, like many things related to its military, deceptive. Of these, only about 2,600 of them are main battle tanks, and of these 2,600, only about 650 25% of them are T-72 B3B3M, T-80 BVM and T-90 AM models that are outfitted with modern fire control systems. According to the Pentagon, by the beginning of 2023, Russia had lost half of the tanks it deployed since its invasion of Ukraine, thanks to their outdated designs, the armored fleet's poor logistics and doctrine, and poor leadership. The T-72 tank remains the workhorse of the Russian military, and has been the most widely deployed Russian tank to Ukraine, rather than the newer T-90. The T-90 has instead played second fiddle to its predecessor, and with good reason. This supposed modern main battle tank's origins, the design flaw it inherently carries, and how it has performed in Ukraine scream failure. Let us explain. The T-90 saw its origins in the late Soviet Union, when the Western powers were producing tanks like the Abrams, Challenger II, and Leopard II. Soviet tank designers were worried about this development and wanted to produce a replacement for their entire tank fleet, one which could compete with the designs their rivals were now making. However, instead of taking a page out of the West's playbook and designing an entirely new tank, the Soviets based the T-90 on a fusion of the T-72 and the T-80. As it turns out, this may not have been the best choice. The Russian machine builder Ural Vagonzavod produced and built the tank, which entered service in 1992, just after the Soviet Union's collapse. It has since been upgraded with the T-90A in 2004, the T-90M in 2016, and the T-90MS in 2017. Russia probably had between 750 and 1,000 of the T-90 and all its variants on hand prior to the invasion of Ukraine. So how was this tank originally designed? Let's start with the basics. The T-90 is operated by a crew of three. The tank also has an integrated autoloader for its 125mm cannon and a low-profile design. Its secondary weapons are 12.7mm cord heavy machine gun and a 7.62mm PKMT belt-fed machine gun. The tank also boasts a Shatora curtain, an electrical jammer that deploys smoke grenades when a missile targets the tank. Infrared lights are also part of its defensive array and these are designed to confuse the guidance system of an incoming tank-killing missile or rocket. The T-90 is built with reactive armor tiles, which are designed to explode when impacted by a tank-killing munition. This helps protect the tank from the full impact of an incoming round. Additionally, the T-90 is built with composite armor materials to make it more rugged against conventional ammunition and precision-guided anti-tank weapons. Unfortunately, these armor systems have often proven less than adequate and when Russia is involved, you can expect corruption too. Just as we saw in the case of Russian body armor, corrupt officers have had a penchant to sell off the reactive armor panels of the T-90 and other tanks because they are valuable in their own right. To replace them, the officers have installed other materials. At first, rumors went around that they had just put egg cartons onto the tank's sides. This was an easy rumor to believe, given Russia's long history of incompetence that included protecting its soldiers with the airsoft version of the Ratnik body armor. In fact, the material in question is a plastic filler called the 4S24 softcase era block, 
Unfortunately for Russia, this is not adequate protection against modern anti-tank rounds, even if they don't just fly over it like the Javelin does. Russia has tried to develop better defenses for its existing tanks. These attempts include the Arena Armor, which made some waves before the war in video demonstrations. In 2021, Russia released footage of the T-72B3 tank defending itself from an incoming RPG-7 rocket by launching an interceptor that destroyed the rocket in flight. The arena's active protection system was responsible for this and appeared to show promise for Russia as a way to further protect its tanks without overburdening them with heavier and heavier armor. The arena system rings the host tank with several millimeter wave radars pointed at different angles. If these radars detect an incoming threat, they will automatically launch an interceptor out of an armored silo located on the tank. Unfortunately for Russia, the arena system proved to be just another marketing campaign and could not be deployed. The arena system has not appeared in Ukraine at any point in the war. Operationally, the T-90 has a top road speed of 43 miles per hour and has an operational range of 310 miles. The tank weighs about 48 tons. The T-90's weight is about 20 tons less than its Western rivals. One would think this would be to its advantage. However, the additional weight of tanks like the Abrams, Challenger 2 and Leopard 2 is usually put into their armor. This additional armor makes them more survivable, which is critical in a world of precision fire and where the first tank to get shot usually dies. Western tanks are simply better protected and more likely to withstand multiple hits, a fact which we've seen play out in Ukraine's campaign in Zaporizhia, where Russian weapons have often been unable to destroy them outright. Rather, these Western tanks have often been damaged in engagements with their crews surviving. They are then sent to the rear for repairs and put back in the fight. At the same time, Russian tanks, which are often exposed in an attempt to inflict disproportionate casualties on their enemy, get killed in the same engagement without adequately fulfilling the mission they were sacrificed for. Before the war in Ukraine, the T-90 had been a popular tank for international sales. International arms deliveries have been one of the few strong points in Russia's post-Soviet economy. Risking those relationships would be the last thing the Kremlin would want to do, which explains the T-90's comparative absence in Ukraine. The T-90's foreign users include Algeria, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Iraq, Vietnam, Syria, and above all, India, which has long had a close arms relationship with Russia and operates about 2,080 T-90 tanks. Unfortunately, performance in Ukraine is only one of the T-90's problems that questioned its prospects for further export abroad. India's experience with the T-90's has proven far from smooth. Indian T-90 tanks were spotted with the infamous cope cages near its border with Pakistan in the middle of October 2023, demonstrating that India is not entirely confident about the tank's defensive qualities, for good reason, because India has experience with faulty T-90s. For example, to fulfill one Indian order of T-90s, the Russian mounted older, less protective turrets to new hulls. Russia exported these turrets to its Indian customer anyway because it had pre-built a lot of them and didn't want to see them go to waste. These were, however, more vulnerable than newer turrets. The comparative lack of protection was not the only problem either. During tests, the Indians found that their new tanks' fire control systems and thermal imaging sites could not cope with their country's hot summer weather. To adapt the T-90 to this climate, Russian manufacturers offered to build specialized air conditioning systems for the tanks, but these also failed, and a tank driver fainted from heatstroke, which forced India to shop abroad to find ways to solve the problem. These and other issues have made India reconsider its tank relationship with Russia. As tensions between it and China mount, and Pakistan remains a constant threat, the last thing India wants is faulty tanks that would prove ineffective in combat. Indeed, the thermal sights on the T-90 for the tank's commanders have proven so bad that the Russians were secretly installing French sights. However, because of sanctions, these are no longer available. The new T-90s will come with the same Russian sights that proved so unsatisfactory in India. The T-90 compares poorly to Western main battle tanks partly because, as we said, it's basically just a variant of the older T-72. Combined with some parts of the T-80, such as the Irtish fire control system, with reactive armor strapped to the chassis. The T-90 was also not designed with open architecture in mind, which means that it is a difficult tank to keep up to date with modern weapons and equipment. Case in point, the T-90's autoloader can't fire Russia's newer and larger anti-tank kinetic projectiles. 
the Vacuum 1 armor-piercing fin-stabilized discarding Sabot. These rounds were designed for the T-14 Armata, but they cannot be reverse-engineered for the T-90 or older tanks. Unfortunately for the Russians, the T-14 has never materialized on the battlefields of Ukraine, so these new anti-tank rounds, which actually pose a threat to the Abrams, Challenger 2 and Leopard 2, have also been absent from the war. If you want to know why so many Western tanks have been damaged but not destroyed, while their Russian counterparts have gone down in flames, this is one of the reasons. Another of the most glaring problems is the T-90's short effective firing range. The tank's main gun is difficult to raise to high angles. The T-90's gun can move up to a range of 14 degrees upward or 6 degrees downward, which severely limits the targets it can hit. As an example, the T-72 and T-80 tanks deployed in Chechnya proved incapable of raising their guns high enough to shoot at rebels on rooftops or behind third-story windows. These rebels destroyed many Russian tanks with anti-tank weapons, while the T-72s and T-80s proved incapable of retaliation with their main guns. Because the T-90 was based on these two tanks, it suffers from the same problems, and it's proving just as bad in tank-v-tank -tank combat in Ukraine. Western main battle tanks like the American Abrams can hit targets up to three miles away, aided by greater gun mobility. In contrast to Russian tanks, the Abrams can raise its turret to an upward angle of 20 degrees or lower it to an angle of 9 degrees, giving it greater range and flexibility. The T-90 cannot do this, so it will lose out at longer range combat. The T-90 is also comparatively deficient in its ability to puncture the armor of opposing modern Western tanks. To safely do so, it will need to get closer to its targets while enemy tanks can stay back at safer ranges. Obviously, this reality is not advantageous for the Russian tank. Poor doctrine was literally built into the T-90's design. One of the reasons the Soviet planners chose not to go with a completely new design for the T-90 was because they wanted the tank to remain cheap, which its predecessor, the T-72, also was. The T-72 was designed to replicate World War II-era flood tactics and overwhelm its opponents with mass. This design has carried over into the T-90, where it's been implemented in Ukraine to poor results. The tank's cost hints at this purpose, as one T-90 costs roughly between $2.5 million to $4.5 million, depending on the variant, which is much less expensive than its Western counterparts. By comparison, an Abrams tank can cost over $10 million per unit, while the Leopard 2 can cost $6 million and the Challenger 2 around $5 million. This comparison in unit costs reveals the Soviet plans to flood the zone with the sheer mass of T-90s they plan to produce. Unfortunately for the Russians, this mass of T-90s never came. Russia lost much of its tank-producing infrastructure in the chaos of the Soviet Union's collapse. The T-90 was notably absent in the First Chechen War. Instead, the T-72 and T-80 were sent into combat, where they performed poorly. By keeping the T-90 out of the fight in Chechnya, Russia was able to maintain the illusion that it was one of the world's best main battle tanks. The Kremlin went on a marketing spree, pretending there was no need to deploy one of the world's best tanks against poorly organized and equipped rebels in Chechnya. According to the Kremlin, the T-90 was above such trivialities. The marketing campaign worked because international sales of the T-90 picked up. When the T-90 did start to see combat, it performed far below the standards that Russia had made the world come to expect from it. Russia's intervention on behalf of Bashar al-Assad in the Syrian civil war quickly put the T-90 to the test. Just as quickly, footage spread on social media showing Syrian rebels destroying T-90 tanks with old Tau missiles. Bashar al-Assad's army received 30 T-90s from Russia. Five or six of them were confirmed to be destroyed by wire-guided Tau 2A missiles between 2016 and 17. It was a preview of things to come in Ukraine. As early as May 2022, Ukrainian troops proved capable of killing the T-90 with a Karl Gustav recoilless rifle in Kharkiv Oblast. This was the first confirmed kill of a T-90 during the war. According to the Oryx blog, Russia has 2,458 visually confirmed tank losses since the war in Ukraine began. Of these, 90 are T-90 tanks. 34 of the losses are of the T-90A, one is a T-90AK, seven are T-90S tanks, and 48 are T-90M tanks. This data is current as of November 5, 2023. One contributor to these losses is the fact that the T-90 comes with a design that stores its ammunition inside the tank compartment. Once the vehicle takes a direct hit, it and its crew will be blown sky-high. 
Russian tank turrets getting sent skyward in explosions have been a common feature circulating on social media footage taken by Ukrainian soldiers. While most of these tanks have been T-72s, the T-90 is no exception and has met the same fate many times. In October 23, spectacular footage taken by a drone circulated showing a T-90 getting totaled by an anti-tank round in Ukraine. The way Russia has used its tanks has not done it any favors and has instead compounded their design flaws. Russia has repeatedly failed to coordinate its armor with its infantry and artillery, often moving armored columns independently of the other branches of its military. Russian tank crews also tend to be poorly trained. Because Russia has lost tanks at high rates with their crews getting killed in the process, Russian tankers tend to be inexperienced. However, even if Russia managed to find a way to fix these deficiencies, the fact is that its tanks are outdated and incapable of standing up to modern Western armor and anti-tank tactics or equipment. And because Russian tanks like the T-90 are obsolescent designs that are not adapted for open architecture, the Kremlin cannot upgrade its tank fleets like its Western rivals can. In particular, the inability for the T-90s and its older siblings to use the new Vacuum 1 round has put them behind the eight ball when it comes to dealing with the modern tanks that Ukraine is now fielding. The lack of open architecture is especially bad news for a Russia that lacks the means to create an adequate replacement tank for its older vehicle, as seen in the failure of the T-14 Armata program. After a decade, only a handful have been built, and sanctions mean that it will be challenging for Russia to get the parts it needs to build more of them. As the T-90 and its older siblings get depleted, Russia has been forced to rely on even older designs like the T-62 and T-54-55. With the steady losses of T-90s, T-80s and T-72s, Russia's tank force has gotten proportionally more outdated, while Ukraine's has gotten proportionally more modern thanks to the aid of its Western allies. Perhaps this is one of the reasons that the Russians seem to have surged the T-90 into combat in recent weeks. T-90 losses have accelerated as Ukraine gains more ground in Zaporizhia, which may demonstrate that Russia has more T-90 tanks on hand and is no longer willing to hold them back from action. Russian factories seem to be producing more T-90s. However, these are still, by their nature, obsolescent designs, and for Russia there seems to be no way out of this conundrum. Even though Ukraine still mostly uses the older, Soviet-era tanks, its arsenal steadily gets more advanced. Germany has announced it will deliver 14 more Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine in early 2024 to replace some of the units Ukraine has lost in recent weeks of fighting in its Zaporizhia offensive. Russia, meanwhile, has no choice but to continue depleting its arsenal and hope that it will be able to bleed more than its enemy will. For all the talk about how advanced it is, the T-90 is merely the latest expression of Russia's traditional way of war, using sheer mass to take more punishment than the enemy can until exhaustion sets in. That was, after all, what the T-90 was designed to do, despite Russia's pretensions to the contrary when selling the tank abroad. The T-90 is far from one of the world's premier main battle tanks. It is instead set into a fixed, obsolete pattern, unable to adapt to the modern battlefield and ineffective against even armed rebels with adequate anti-tank equipment, let alone organized Western armies with top-of-the-line equipment. Russia may be able to win through attrition in Ukraine using these tanks as part of the program, but it will come at a high price for little gain and the loss of much of its effective land power. The tank fleet has long been Russia's pride and joy, but in Ukraine, it's getting beaten at its own game and will emerge with far less capability than it had before the invasion began. The T-90 had a lot of hype going into the conflict, but that was all. In the war's aftermath, no matter how it ends up, Russia will have far fewer main battle tanks to call on in any future conflict or to present an effective land deterrent. But what do you think about the T-90 and its results in Ukraine? Is there anything that Russia could have or still can do differently? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button for more military analysis from military experts. Before the invasion of Ukraine, Russia prided itself on its tank force and many international military experts bought into the Kremlin's hype. Russia had the world's largest tank fleet at over 12,500 units, and Western experts feared that its newest tank, the T-14 Armada, would prove superior to any of the tanks in NATO's arsenal. Another of the Russian armored vehicles that Western experts feared before the invasion was the scary-sounding BMPT Terminator. This vehicle was fast, well-armored, and armed to the teeth, and yet when it was deployed to the battlefields of Ukraine, 
it proved to be of little consequence, unable to change the tempo of the war. While effective, the BMPT Terminator proved far from the terror that the Kremlin said it was. Let's take a look at the history of the BMPT Terminator and how it did not exactly perform as Russia's military bloggers and Putin's regime advertised when it actually went to war. The BMPT Terminator saw its origins in the Chechen Wars of the 1990s. In these urban conflicts, Chechen fighters armed with light anti-tank weapons like RPGs took a terrible toll on Russian armored forces as troops bearing these arms fired down from rooftops and high-story perches on the thinly protected tops of Russian tanks, destroying them in large numbers. To make matters worse for the Russian armor, it could not retaliate because the turrets on Russia's tanks and armored vehicles, like the BMP, cannot raise their main guns at high angles. They can't lower their guns to low angles either, and Chechen fighters would ambush them from basements too. In response to the poor performance of its armored forces against the Chechens, the Russians designed a new armored vehicle, the BMPT Terminator. While these vehicles are designed to support main battle tanks in urban warfare, they come armed with twin 30mm autocannons capable of firing multiple types of rounds, ranging from hardened armor-piercing rounds to explosive shells. Both autocannons come with a capacity of 850 rounds. To make the Terminator more versatile, it can load different rounds in each of its autocannons, so one gun can fire anti-personnel rounds and another can shoot armor-piercing shells. The autocannons have a range between 2.5 and, and 4 kilometers depending on the round. The targeting system was originally designed to give gunners the ability to designate one target for one round and another for a different round if need be, but this was found to be confusing and impractical and subsequently discontinued by the Russian brass. It is possible that this capability could be restored with advances in artificial intelligence, but given that this is Russia we're talking about, it's probably best not to bet on that possibility coming to fruition anytime soon. BMPT Terminator tanks can also carry a set of four Attacka T 130mm guided missiles, two in pods on either side of the vehicle's autocannons. These missiles are versatile and can be used in an anti armor role, a high explosive building clearing role, or even to attack some helicopters. Thermobaric versions can also be deployed. The Attacka missiles can hit targets up to six kilometers away. As a tertiary weapon, the BMPT Terminator has a 7.62mm PTKM machine gun with a capacity of 2,100 rounds. One version of the Terminator also comes armed with four AG-17D 30mm grenade launchers with a capacity of up to 600 rounds, which it can fire at a rate of 480 rounds per minute. These grenades have a kill radius of 7 meters and a range of 1.7 kilometers. The vehicle has a crew of five men. And there's another version of the Terminator, which lacks the grenade launchers and comes with a crew of three. The BMPT Terminator has separate sights for the commander and gunner, giving it redundancy if one of the sights malfunctions. Laser range finders and computerized fire control systems support these sights. These systems are designed to operate in conjunction with the vehicle's high speed of 60 km per hour while it's cruising. Defensively, the BMPT Terminator is shielded by explosive reactive armor. This is armor that disrupts anti-tank weapons by exploding outwards when a projectile makes contact with it, preventing the worst from happening to the vehicle. The Terminator has metal grills on its sides and back also, which can reduce the penetration power of some anti-armor weapons. The vehicle also has six smoke grenades on each side of the turret and a screening system that warns the crew if their vehicle is being subjected to laser tracking. The Terminator's crew can raise the vehicle's gun turret to 45 degrees, allowing them to fire at threats from above. The turret can also move downward to negative 5 degrees, making the vehicle effective at attacking targets from below or directly in front of it. The turret can also spin 360 degrees. This maneuverability makes the BMPT Terminator far less vulnerable than other Russian tanks and armored vehicles. This one can actually retaliate if troops fire on it from rooftops. The vehicle weighs about 53 tons and has a cruising range of 500 kilometers. Its engine is nearly 1,000 horsepower, and it's maneuverable. The Terminator can traverse ditches between 2.6 and 2.8 meters wide. It can also dive into 1.2 meters of water, which can increase to 1.8 meters if it uses a snorkel. The BMPT Terminator is manufactured by Ural Wagenzavar, the company based in Nizhny Tagil and Sverdlovsk Oblast, which manufactures many of Russia's other tanks and armored vehicles. Future plans for the BMPT Terminator include the possibility of it becoming fully robotic. 
The Terminator's existence reflects Russian doctrine about warfare. Western countries learned from urban fighting in Iraq about just how important it is to integrate infantry and armored units effectively. In these counterinsurgency operations, infantry would dismount and clear buildings, infantry and armored units would support one another closely in this process. It was a combined arms approach to city fighting. Russian doctrine, however, is all about tanks and artillery, so it designed an armored vehicle that would answer the problems that it faced in urban combat in Chechnya. According to Russian doctrine, each main battle tank in an urban setting should be protected by two Terminators. While in open terrain, it's the opposite. Each Terminator should be protected by two tanks. Unfortunately for the Kremlin, since Russia only has a few Terminators in active service and it is questionable if it'll be able to manufacture any more thanks to Western sanctions, this doctrine has proven not quite applicable in Ukraine. Russia doesn't seem sure about how to use its new Terminator tanks, and this uncertainty has played out on the battlefield. But more on that in a moment. Despite all the hype, the program had a rocky start in Russia, and Kazakhstan was the first operator of the BMPT Terminator. The latter ordered 10 of the vehicles in 2010 and saw them delivered between 2011 and 2013. Algeria was the second operator, ordering 300 in April 2016, but only 13 wound up being delivered. Azerbaijan and Peru expressed interest in the Terminator tank, but none were ever delivered to those countries. The BMPT Terminator finally found service in its homeland in the late 2010s. In 2017, the Russian ground forces signed a contract agreeing to use the BMPT Terminator. The vehicles were delivered and entered service in the Russian military the following year. The BMPT and its variants are built on the chassis of a T-72 or a T-90 tank. The Russian brass has talked about building a Terminator 3 unit on the chassis of the T-14 Armada. However, given that only about 20 Armada tanks have ever been built, the Terminator 3 is unlikely to come to fruition anytime soon. The BMPT Terminator, like so much of Russia's supposedly most advanced warfighting assets, was initially absent in the invasion of Ukraine. The reasons for this are not known, but given that Putin believed his military's own hype and expected the regime in Kyiv to fall in days, he might have believed that it was not necessary to risk one of Russia's best weapon systems, one which had already seen some sales abroad. When Kyiv did not fall and the Russian military found itself in a long war of attrition, things began to change. The first Terminator units were spotted in Ukraine in May 2022 in the Battle of Severodonetsk, three months after the invasion. The deployment of this unit was mostly psychological, although the BMPT Terminator's combat debut came at a moment when Russia was proving most effective in the war, there were far too few of these vehicles to meaningfully affect the outcome of military operations. Indeed, footage swirled of the BMPT Terminator needing to retreat from its first combat engagement. That would be far from the end of its story in Ukraine, however. The relatively few Terminator armored vehicles have performed better than Russia's main battle tank fleet which has taken terrible casualties in the face of Ukrainian resistance. Some Russian military bloggers have even implored the Kremlin to replace the outdated T-72 tank with Terminator units. In stark contrast to Russia's traditional tanks, which have often been blown sky-high thanks to their ammunition storage design, the BMPT Terminator has taken few casualties. The BMPT Terminator does not have the same design flaw as Russia's main battle tanks, giving it increased survivability which may be one of the reasons it was able to retreat to safety in May 2022. According to some of the military bloggers, the Terminator has proven formidable in urban and forested environments in Ukraine. The survivability dichotomy between the Terminator and its main battle tank comrades played out after the former's deployment in Ukraine. Although deployed only in small numbers, the first confirmed kill of a BMPT Terminator came in February 2023, nine months after the unit's initial entry into the war meaning that these units had survived until then. The BMPT Terminator's design seems well-suited for modern warfare. Russia's always emphasized its tank forces, but tank-on-tank -tank combat has proven rare in Ukraine. Indirect fire, especially with the help of drones, has been the norm in Ukraine. Drones and other precision strikes make it far easier to spot tanks and shoot them indirectly over great distances, long before they ever get into range for a traditional tank duel. The death of the tank so often spoken of in military circles, has proven far from the case in Ukraine though, despite the relative lack of traditional tank combat there. Tanks remain useful for storming enemy positions, but the traditional tank gun is less suited for this purpose. After all, if tank-on-tank -tank combat is becoming rarer, 
tank turrets loaded with rounds to take out other tanks might not be so optimal. This is where the BMPT Terminator has seemed to shine. Footage taken of the Terminator vehicles in Ukraine seems to show them performing well in multi-purpose rapid assault roles. Video footage has also shown Terminator vehicles fighting well at night. In July 2023, Russia's Terminator tank took part in action near Avdiivka, in what may have been part of a staging operation for Russia's offensive toward that settlement later in the year. Russian sources claim that during a night engagement, a Terminator fired 400 high-explosive fragmentation and armor-piercing shells at Ukrainian targets four kilometers away. So, how has Ukraine dealt with Russian Terminator vehicles, which have proven among them more effective in the conflict? Has the BMPT Terminator lived up to the hype that some of the Russian military bloggers have assigned to it? Ukraine scored its first confirmed kill of a BMPT Terminator in February 2023, when an artillery unit scored a direct hit on one in Kremina in Luhansk Oblast. The gunners attacked a Terminator that had been sitting idly on a forest road. The unit may have been damaged or had mechanical difficulties before then. The damage to this unit was total. The artillery shell struck the vehicle's ammunition magazine, indicated by the fireball in the blast. Ukraine has also demonstrated its ability to be more innovative in the ways it's destroyed the Terminator tanks. The next confirmed combat loss of a BMPT Terminator came in August 2023 near the town of Spartak in Donetsk Oblast. There, Ukraine once again proved its prowess in drone warfare. Ukraine Special Forces Group Alpha posted a video showing a swarm of small, grenade-bearing, first-person view drones chasing down and assaulting one of Russia's Terminator tanks. The Terminator was at least immobilized after the action and needed to be towed by a nearby T-80 main battle tank. That tank was also hit in a drone strike. This incident lacked the fireball that accompanied the Terminator destroyed in the February attack, so the unit may have been salvageable. Ukrainian forces nevertheless gloated about the incident, saying on X, formerly Twitter, this rare model of enemy weaponry burned down after only a few hits from kamikaze drones. They tried to pull out the downed Terminator with a T-80 tank, but it was also hit. FVP drones have proven to be some of Ukraine's best anti-vehicle weapons, and they are cheap, costing only about $5,000 each. Their cheapness and ease of control with a virtual reality headset has made them popular on both sides of the conflict. The Terminator may have been designed to shoot at upward targets, but it was clearly not prepared to shoot at multiple fast-moving targets like FPV drones. The vehicle may not have been put permanently out of commission, but given that only perhaps 10 of them have been deployed to Ukraine, the loss of even one is a great blow to Russia. The third incident came in September 2023, on the 27th of the month. Ukrainian soldiers, this time in the mutant group, again employed FPV drones, again near Spartak, to damage or destroy a BMPT Terminator. The vehicle had used an infamous cope cage for added protection, but that was not enough to prevent the drones from going to town on it. Given the timing and vicinity of the incident, some observers wondered whether this vehicle was the same as the Terminator damaged in August, but there was no way to verify this. A BREM recovery vehicle was also damaged in the attack. Again, there was no fireball indicating that its ammunition had been torched, but the vehicle was at least temporarily out of commission, and Ukraine proved the concept of attacking Russia's Terminator tanks with drones. Repeat successful drone attacks show one of the Terminator's weaknesses and the weakness of other contemporary armored vehicles. The BMPT Terminator might be armed to the teeth, but it is not designed to hit such fast-moving small targets. The Terminator's engineers were reportedly trying to improve the vehicle's air defense systems as early as 2018, but these improvements were meant to be against helicopters, especially ones capable of firing missiles from distances of up to 5 kilometers. Drone defenses were not mentioned. The Terminator tank comes with other weaknesses too. The vehicle might have a lot in the way of offense, but defensively it is lacking. In contrast to the turret of a main battle tank, a Terminator's turret is much more lightly armored. The vehicle's missiles are armored to protect against explosive fragments and shrapnel, but that's about it. The hull might protect the crew, but the top of the vehicle is vulnerable. Concentrated small arms fire on the turret of a Terminator tank would be sufficient to imperil its weapons. The design is particularly vulnerable to something like a javelin, which attacks its target on a downward trajectory to avoid the most heavily armored features of the tank, or in this case, the BMPT Terminator. Another problem that the Terminator tank has is it lacks the situational awareness that a combined arms approach to warfare would have. 
no matter how advanced its sensors are. The United States learned through experience in Iraq that armored vehicles cannot replace the situational awareness and rapid response time of infantry support. It's a lesson that Russia clearly has not learned in Ukraine. Although Soviet gear and doctrine still permeates much of the Ukrainian military, it is rapidly absorbing the lessons in doctrine and training afforded by its Western allies, and Ukraine has had much better success in integrating infantry and other arms with its armor than its Russian opponents have. The two Ukrainian drone attacks against Terminator tanks serve as a good example. Russia's overall failure of giving its Terminator and other armored vehicles adequate infantry support is one of the reasons why it has lost so many of them in the conflict. The Terminator tank escaped to this fate for a time, but two incidents in two months demonstrate that Ukraine is adapting to the presence of this vehicle. Interestingly, one of the ways that Ukraine originally sought to adapt to the Russian Terminator tank was to build a model of its own. These vehicles are known as the Stras, or Sentinel. In October 2017, a Ukrainian company called Zytomir Armored Plant unveiled an armored vehicle similar to Russia's Terminator tank. It used the chassis of a T-64 main battle tank and had a turret that also looked like the Terminator's. The turret boasted twin ZTM-2 30mm autocannons, a Ukrainian adaptation of the Soviet ZA-42. Two PKT 7.62mm machine guns served as secondary weapons. The Sentinel also came packed with four anti-tank guided missile launchers, with two mounted on the side of each turret. There was also an AG-17 30mm automatic grenade launcher in the center on top of the turret. Three smoke grenade launchers were attached to the sides of the turret as well, giving the vehicle more concealability in the event that it came under attack. The Sentinel was designed for a crew of three men. The vehicle unveiled in 2017 had explosive reactive armor on its front and sides. The driver sat in the front at the center of the hull, with the other two crew members at the front of the turret. Each crew member was to have their own hatch. The driver had a periscope, and the top of the turret was mounted with a video monitor, laser rangefinder, and electronic systems. However, despite these seemingly impressive features, Ukraine never put these vehicles into mass production and has not used them in its fight against the Russian invaders. Information on why it chose not to pursue the Sentinel is a little elusive, but it could be because of NATO training. Since Western doctrine insists on close cooperation between infantry and armor, while Russian doctrine tends to solve all problems with tanks and artillery, Ukraine might have no longer seen a need for the production of an expensive tank when it could focus on cheaper, more rapid-fire support systems for its traditional tanks, like anti-armor infantry and drones. Given the limited number of BMPT Terminator tanks that Russia's built, the vehicle's vulnerable turret, and its now demonstrated weakness to drones, it may be that Ukraine was wise to avoid what could have been a costly rabbit hole. The jury is still out on the Terminator's overall effectiveness on the modern battlefield compared to a traditional tank, but the idea promoted by some of the Russian military bloggers that this vehicle would be a major boost for Russia's struggling effort in Ukraine appears to be just that, an idea. What do you think about the BMPT Terminator tank? If it were produced in greater numbers, would it have been better luck on modern battlefields than Russia's main battle tank fleet? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts. When you break down the T-90 on paper, Russia's most modern battle tank looks pretty fierce. Among other high-tech accessories, it boasts a 125mm smoothbore gun, modular composite armor, and a 1,000-plus horsepower V12 diesel engine. In theory, it offers excellent mobility, protection, and firepower, along with the ability to launch armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding sabot rounds, and anti-tank guided missiles. The T-90 also has several variants and has been a popular export due to its relatively high cost-to-benefit ratio. Then why, you might be wondering, has the T-90 been such an epic failure on the battlefield? To be fair, it's not just the T-90s that are dropping like flies. As Russia's war with Ukraine continues, since February last year, the Russian Armored Corps losses have since reached more than 2,100 tanks. That's around two-thirds of the tanks Russia initially rolled out of Moscow on their way to Kyiv. Russia has lost so many tanks, in fact, that they've had to reactivate and deploy hundreds of older models, including the T-72 Ural, T-62, and T-5455, some of which are 50, 60, even 70 years old. And most of these have headed to the front without any meaningful upgrades, 
not since the collapse of the Soviet Union anyway, to their optics, fire control systems, or armor. It probably wasn't the first choice, one could imagine, of the boys back at the Kremlin to roll out these older models. This decision likely has something to do with the recent spike in losses of their prized T-90s. In total, Russian troops have been forced to scrap or abandon nearly 60 of these 53-ton, three-person tanks, roughly 15% of Russia's pre-war inventory, with most being lost in only the last few months. But wait, aren't these supposed to be the baddest tanks around? That's certainly what the Kremlin's been saying. Before we get to the specific factors contributing to the T-90's proposed survivability, or lack thereof, let's take a moment to address one other important point. When we zoom out, there's an argument to be made that the increasing number of T-90's being destroyed on the battlefield in Ukraine might actually be a negative sign of things to come for our friends in Kyiv. How's that? Well, let's look at it like this. One reason that so many T-90's have been destroyed recently, but certainly not the only reason, is that there's been more of them deployed to destroy. Translation, Russia's current production of T-90s has been picking up, as Putin's nearly two-year effort to boost tank production finally seems to be paying off. Apparently, Russia has been able to work around some of its increasingly tighter foreign sanctions, including those on critical high-end electronics that it was once importing from France. As mentioned before, the number of destroyed or captured T-90s accounts for roughly a quarter of Russia's pre-war inventory. This overall number, however, does not include the hundreds that have been produced by the Ural Vagonzavod plant in Svedlovsk Oblast since the start of 2022. Russia's increased productivity could become a serious problem for Ukraine, considering its main tank plant, the Malyshev factory in Kharkiv, currently lacks the capacity to produce new tanks from scratch and is limited to performing upgrades and repairs. This leaves Ukraine's armored forces mostly reliant on foreign donations if they intend to deploy a fleet of modern Western-style tanks, which they have, including German Leopard 2s, British Challenger 2s, and the American M1 Abrams. But are foreign donations going to be able to match Russian tank production? Well, it's hard to say, but it probably wouldn't hurt for Ukraine's Western allies to throw in a few more tanks, especially because the Ural Vagonzavod plant can, hypothetically, produce enough new T-90s in the next six months to match Ukraine's current inventory of comparable, modern battle tanks. But even if this theory is true, and an increasing number of T-90s are being destroyed largely because more are being manufactured and deployed, that certainly isn't the whole story. The overall effectiveness and functionality of the T-90 has been a matter of debate since the beginning, with many distinguished experts expertly concluding that, overall, the T-90 is a piece of junk. First introduced as the T-72BU, then renamed the T-90 to distinguish it from all the other T-72 variants, the T-90 was thought to be one of the most well-protected tanks in the world, while also boasting one of the most heavily equipped battle systems currently on the market. After being officially brought into service in 1992, the T-90 has received a number of upgrades and subsequent name changes. In 2004, it was renamed the T-90A, and then in 2016, it was upgraded and rebranded again as the T-90M. Then, after its most recent upgrade in 2017, it came to be called the T-90MS. There were also less popular variants along the way, but those aren't worth mentioning here. Since its conception, one of the major selling points of the T-90 has been its relatively low cost. Save for the most recent variant, the T-90MS, which runs closer to $4 million, the full line of older, less expensive T-90 models can still be purchased and exported for around $3 million. Even though it continues to be produced primarily for use by the Russian Army's armored division, the Kremlin has sold and exported thousands of T-90s, mostly T-90S variants, to countries such as Algeria, Armenia, and Iraq. In fact, India alone is now in possession of more than 2,000 Russian-built T-90Ss. Underneath the hood, so to speak, of all currently available T-90 variants is a V-12 diesel engine. The most powerful, coming in at 1,130 horsepower, can be found on the T-90MS. The T-90 is also about 20 tons lighter than the M1 Abrams, and was designed to accommodate and be operated by, thanks to its auto-loading firing system, just a three-man crew. Upon closer inspection, however, the effectiveness of both the engine and loading system have come into question, but more on that a bit later. So what about firepower? Well, if the T-90 has one thing going for it, it definitely has a lot of that. The T-90's 2A46M4 125mm smoothbore main gun 
can fire a range of high-tech ammunition options, including armor-piercing, fin-stabilized discarding sabot rounds, as well as the anti-tank guided missiles mentioned earlier, also known as the 9M119 Reflex, or by NATO as the AT-11 Sniper. These high-tech projectiles have a maximum range of 4,000 meters, with a flight time of 11.7 seconds, and can, under certain conditions, even take down helicopters. Also in terms of firepower, the T-90 features two externally mounted machine guns. One is a 12.7mm cord heavy machine gun that has a cycle rate of fire of 700 to 800 rounds per minute and can be remotely operated from within the tank. The other is a PKMT 7.62mm coaxial machine gun. And when it comes to protection, in addition to conventional armor plating, modern T-90 variants also come equipped with two very high-tech defensive systems. The first is the Shatora-1, an active protection system made by the Russian company Electronic Torg that includes a 360-degree laser warning receiver complete with automatically triggered countermeasures that deploy if the tank is painted by an enemy laser. This device can even orient the tank's main gun in the direction of the laser's origin. The Shatora-1, among other features, also comes with an infrared jammer and a grenade launching system that has the capacity to discharge smoke grenades which release an infrared obscuring aerosol cloud. The modern T-90's second line of defense is its Contact 5 Explosive Reactive Armor, or ERA, which is essentially a layer of high explosive sandwiched between two metal plates designed to minimize the damage of explosive projectiles by detonating just prior to their impact. Pretty fancy, right? ERA was specifically designed to counter a range of advanced weaponry including missiles and rockets carrying high-explosive anti-tank warheads, as well as highly deadly sabot rounds, which separate after being fired and turn into a thin, fin-stabilized rod made of depleted uranium. Once a sabot round impacts an enemy tank, the kinetic force it creates while penetrating also creates a steam of molten metal that pours into the cabin with it. This instantaneously increases the temperature and pressure inside of the sealed turret, killing or rather cooking everyone inside. The T-90 also comes with a magnetic mine detection system that, when functioning properly, uses an electromagnetic pulse to disable mines before the tank can run over them. So then, what's the deal, you might be asking? Why aren't these extra fancy protection systems making the T-90s unstoppable? For one, these systems haven't performed so well against long-range anti-tank guided missiles. There was one report that stated a Ukrainian took out two T-90Ms back-to-back using an AT-4 anti-tank weapon. If that report is accurate, this would be a very impressive set of skills. The Swedish-made Saab AT-4, given to the Ukrainians by the US and Sweden, is a lightweight, shoulder-launched anti-armor weapon. However, despite delivering an 84mm projectile out to a range of 300 meters, this unguided weapon should not be effective against a T-90M's reactive armor, which the manufacturers claim is effective against not just low-speed rockets and missiles, but also tank rounds coming in at hypersonic speeds. There are, it seems, even more embarrassing ways to lose a tank, which Russia has also discovered recently. Apparently, a group of Russian technicians accidentally set fire to a T-72 they were attempting to repair. In the confusion, the ammunition on board caught fire and exploded, completely destroying the tank and damaging two others nearby. The loss of this tank and the two T-90Ms suggest that a more complex set of problems might be plaguing the Russian military. And this makes the actual durability and effectiveness of the T-90 more difficult to determine. Is the hyped T-90M any less vulnerable than earlier models? It's hard to tell when it's regularly being used without proper tactical or common sense. Another reason the T-90 was poorly conceived compared to other main battle tanks is that its underlying design is outdated. Ultimately, as we mentioned before, the T-90 is simply an improved version of the T-72. Essentially, the turret of the T-80 and the hull and drivetrain of the T-72 combined together and covered over with reactive armor. And because the T-90 is in its essence only an update, it retains all of the defects of its bargain-built older brothers. Its inherent shortcomings, leading to the apparent failure of the T-90's ultra-modern defensive systems, is one thing. But this tank has also been the victim of tactical incompetence and has regularly been rolled into impossible, no-win situations. In modern warfare, advancing tanks are supposed to be supported by infantry for the very purpose of suppressing enemy ground troops who might be using anti-tank weapons, like the AT-4. 
Deployed armor should also have artillery support, if only to help mitigate any long-range threats. Sending tanks forward without defensive support, as Russia has continued to do in Ukraine, makes them extremely vulnerable, especially to infantry units using shoulder-launched weapons. Mobile ground units, when allowed to get in close, can carry out ambushes at short range, which allows them to focus their attacks on a tank's more vulnerable target areas. A particularly vulnerable area for these tanks that's also been exposed by the creative fighting tactics being used in Ukraine is the roof. So it seems the T-90 has had some trouble with the anti-tank missiles that are fired from elevated positions and ultimately come down onto these vehicles from above. The T-90's 360-degree active protection system is supposed to protect from this sort of attack, and its failure to do so might suggest that this fancy new system isn't as infallible as first advertised. A range of other deficiencies came to light after the first T-90 was captured, intact, from the battlefield in Ukraine. With the tank now safely in their possession, military specialists from the Ukrainian Center for the Study of Captured and Prospective Weapons and Military Equipment were able to conduct an analysis of all internal equipment and armaments and went on to publicly announce their findings in March of 2023. When, around the same time, another T-90A was captured, this one was apparently handed over to the US, also for the purpose of research. But when one of Russia's most modern pieces of armor was spotted on a trailer in Louisiana, then subsequently photographed, a debate surrounding the tank's unlikely appearance on American soil exploded on social media. It isn't fully known what the US ultimately had planned for the tank, but we do know what Ukraine did with theirs. They ripped it apart, literally and figuratively. Once the team of Ukrainian experts had completed their investigation, they claimed to have uncovered little more than an old T-72 hiding beneath the shell of widespread Russian propaganda labeling Russia's new war machine an overall failure and not nearly the breakthrough the Kremlin had been all along claiming it to be. The team of engineers from the Center for the Study of Captured and Prospective Weapons and Military Equipment also noted that the well-praised automatic loader was largely the same design as could be found on the older T-72, the only major difference being that the ammo was now stored in a separate compartment outside the turret this modification, however, created the complication of tankers having to fully exit the vehicle in order to load ammunition into the main compartment, which, to be done with any practical sense or relative amount of safety, would require that the tank leave the field of battle. Talk about taking yourself out of the fight. The center also reportedly discovered significant limitations concerning the T-90's B92S2F V12 diesel engine, which Ukrainian engineers claimed did not have sufficient power to reliably propel the vehicle, a claim that was supported by videos of T-90s getting stuck in the mud. They also noted that the highly praised Kalina computerized fire control system had incorporated in its design not only civilian electronic components, but some of Western origin. While other electronic components had been assembled without adhering to moisture control requirements, resulting in increased oxidation, shortened lifespan, and unexpected failure. But the embarrassment of Russian tank builders isn't the Kremlin's biggest problem here. If Ukraine persists in revealing the secrets and vulnerabilities of the allegedly advanced systems and technologies of the T-90, this could potentially create a serious financial challenge for Russia in the future. By giving other countries the information needed to produce their own, while simultaneously diminishing the hype surrounding the Russian-made T-90, sales are bound to diminish. And this is no small sum we're talking about. Russia has currently received a combined total of nearly $10 billion for exported T-90s from India and Algeria alone, but a fair amount of damage seems to have already been done. As reports of the T-90s mediocrity have continued to surface, many foreign companies that had previously signed contracts with Russia have swiftly cancelled those agreements. All these technological and mechanical shortcomings, though, are only part of the bigger story. The lack of success the T-90 has had on the battlefield in Ukraine cannot be truly understood without looking at the opposition they faced. It would be a disservice to Ukraine's ferocious troops to do otherwise. Combined with grit and determination born largely of national pride, Ukrainian forces have also received an impressive amount of anti-tank weaponry from the US as well as other allies. From the US alone, Ukraine has received more than 10,000 Javelin anti-armor systems, 90,000 other anti-armor systems and munitions, 8,000 tube-launched, optically-tracked, wire-guided TAU missiles, 
35,000 grenade launchers and small arms, 4 million rounds of small arms ammunition and grenades, and a whole slew of laser-guided rocket systems, rocket launchers, and anti-tank mines. According to Washington's regularly updated list of wartime contributions, which includes 31 Abrams tanks, 45 T-72B tanks, 186 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles, 20 Mi-17 helicopters, dozens of combat drones, lots of state-of-the-art satellite communications equipment, and more than 100,000 sets of body armor and helmets, President Biden has provided nearly $44 billion in military assistance to Ukraine thus far. Weapons are a critical part of warfare, that's obvious, but without resourcefulness, they will only take a conventional force so far, which makes the new tactic Ukrainian forces have been using against Russian tanks that much more impressive. To go along with their already proven yet more traditional ambush maneuvers, they've also developed a highly creative yet simple way of utilizing landmines. Essentially, as a Russian mine plow clears a path through a known minefield, Ukrainian troops will wait for it to pass, then toss fresh mines onto the same path right in front and sometimes behind the trailing convoy, effectively littering the cleared corridor with new mines. The vehicles following the mine plow end up hitting these mines or run over the mines as they try to escape the trap. To execute this brazen new maneuver, the Ukrainians have been utilizing two different types of mines. One is the Soviet TM-62, the other is the American Remote Anti-Armor Mine System, or RAM, of which the US has donated more than 30,000. The 21-pound TM-62 is what you think of when you think of a traditional mine, basically a big metal disc packed with explosives and fitted with some sort of fuse. The RAM, on the other hand, is slightly different and consists of nine mines that are four pounds each stacked together in a hollow 155mm artillery shell. With practice, Ukrainian troops have found that a few well-aimed volleys can scatter scores of these, each with a magnetic fuse, across a relatively wide area. This tactic has been a big success recently, as armored vehicles have continued to roll in neat lines across the fields and forests between the Russian-occupied cities of Pavlivka and Volodar. And what often happens, after the lead tank hits a mine and explodes, the rest of the column attempts to scatter. Some vehicles try to go around the wrecked lead vehicle, only to hit a mine themselves. In these scenarios, even retreat is dangerous, as there might be fresh mines now scattered behind the column, littered across the very path it used to come through. In the past weeks, in the region surrounding Volodar, the Russians have lost 30 or more armored vehicles, including a few tanks, and it seems that well-placed mines have largely been the cause. To defeat these tactics and save a few of their prized T-90s, Russia will need, at minimum, better intelligence and a more flexible command and control strategy. In theory, the narrow TM-62 minefields shouldn't be that hard to avoid if the opposing force was able to, let's say, organize 24-hour surveillance and a reliable means of disseminating information to its frontline forces. And Russia will need exactly that if they want to keep ahead of Ukraine's clearly savvy military engineers. But what do you think? Have the technical shortcomings of the Russian T-90 been the primary cause of its poor performance? Or are these tanks being utilized poorly and judged unfairly? Also, how might foreign military aid and Ukraine's improvised tactics be contributing to the loss of so many Russian tanks? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. And Putin's regime advertised when it actually went to war. The BMPT Terminator saw its origins in the Chechen Wars of the 1990s. In these urban conflicts, Chechen fighters armed with light anti-tank weapons like RPGs took a terrible toll on Russian armored forces, as troops bearing these arms fired down from rooftops and high-story perches on the thinly protected tops of Russian tanks, destroying them in large numbers. To make matters worse for the Russian armor, it could not retaliate because the turrets on Russia's tanks and armored vehicles, like the BMP, cannot raise their main guns at high angles. They can't lower their guns to low angles either, and Chechen fighters would ambush them from basements too. In response to the poor performance of its armored forces against the Chechens, the Russians designed a new armored vehicle, the BMPT Terminator. While these vehicles are designed to support main battle tanks in urban warfare, they come armed with twin 30mm autocannons, capable of firing multiple types of rounds, ranging from hardened armor-piercing rounds to explosive shells. Both autocannons come with a capacity of 850 rounds, 
To make the Terminator more versatile, it can load different rounds in each of its autocannons, so one gun can fire anti-personnel rounds and another can shoot armor-piercing shells. The autocannons have a range between 2.5 and 4 kilometers depending on the round. The targeting system was originally designed to give gunners the ability to designate one target for one round and another for a different round if need be, but this was found to be confusing and impractical and subsequently discontinued by the Russian brass. It is possible that this capability could be restored with advances in artificial intelligence, but given that this is Russia we're talking about, it's probably best not to bet on that possibility coming to fruition anytime soon. BMPT Terminator tanks can also carry a set of four Attacka T 130mm guided missiles, two in pods on either side of the vehicle's autocannons. These missiles are versatile and can be used in an anti armor role, a high explosive building clearing role, or even to attack some helicopters. Thermobaric versions can also be deployed. The Attacka missiles can hit targets up to six kilometers away. As a tertiary weapon, the BMPT Terminator has a 7.62mm PTKM machine gun with a capacity of 2,100 rounds. One version of the Terminator also comes armed with four AG-17D 30mm grenade launchers with a capacity of up to 600 rounds, which it can fire at a rate of 480 rounds per minute. These grenades have a kill radius of 7 meters and a range of 1.7 kilometers. The vehicle has a crew of five men. And there's another version of the Terminator, which lacks the grenade launchers and comes with a crew of three. The BMPT Terminator has separate sights for the commander and gunner, giving it redundancy if one of the sights malfunctions. Laser range finders and computerized fire control systems support these sights. These systems are designed to operate in conjunction with the vehicle's high speed of 60 km per hour while it's cruising. Defensively, the BMPT Terminator is shielded by explosive reactive armor. This is armor that disrupts anti-tank weapons by exploding outwards when a projectile makes contact with it, preventing the worst from happening to the vehicle. The Terminator has metal grills on its sides and back also, which can reduce the penetration power of some anti-armor weapons. The vehicle also has six smoke grenades on each side of the turret and a screening system that warns the crew if their vehicle is being subjected to laser tracking. The Terminator's crew can raise the vehicle's gun turret to 45 degrees, allowing them to fire at threats from above. The turret can also move downward to negative 5 degrees, making the vehicle effective at attacking targets from below or directly in front of it. The turret can also spin 360 degrees. This maneuverability makes the BMPT Terminator far less vulnerable than other Russian tanks and armored vehicles. This one can actually retaliate if troops fire on it from rooftops. The vehicle weighs about 53 tons and has a cruising range of 500 kilometers. Its engine is nearly 1,000 horsepower, and it's maneuverable. The Terminator can traverse ditches between 2.6 and 2.8 meters wide. It can also dive into 1.2 meters of water, which can increase to 1.8 meters if it uses a snorkel. The BMPT Terminator is manufactured by Ural Wagenzavar, the company based in Nizhny Tagil and Sverdlovsk Oblast, which manufactures many of Russia's other tanks and armored vehicles. Future plans for the BMPT Terminator include the possibility of it becoming fully robotic. The Terminator's existence reflects Russian doctrine about warfare. Western countries learned from urban fighting in Iraq about just how important it is to integrate infantry and armored units effectively. In these counterinsurgency operations, infantry would dismount and clear buildings, infantry and armored units would support one another closely in this process. It was a combined arms approach to city fighting. Russian doctrine, however, is all about tanks and artillery, so it designed an armored vehicle that would answer the problems that it faced in urban combat in Chechnya. According to Russian doctrine, each main battle tank in an urban setting should be protected by two Terminators, while in open terrain it's the opposite, each Terminator should be protected by two tanks. Unfortunately for the Kremlin, since Russia only has a few Terminators in active service, and it is questionable if it'll be able to manufacture any more thanks to Western sanctions, this doctrine has proven not quite applicable in Ukraine. Russia doesn't seem sure about how to use its new Terminator tanks, and this uncertainty has played out on the battlefield. But more on that in a moment. Despite all the hype, the program had a rocky start in Russia, and Kazakhstan was the first operator of the BMPT Terminator. The latter ordered 10 of the vehicles in 2010 and saw them delivered between 2011 and 2013. Algeria was the second operator, ordering 300 in April 2016, but only 13 wound up being delivered. 
Azerbaijan and Peru expressed interest in the Terminator tank, but none were ever delivered to those countries. The BMPT Terminator finally found service in its homeland in the late 2010s. In 2017, the Russian ground forces signed a contract agreeing to use the BMPT Terminator. The vehicles were delivered and entered service in the Russian military the following year. The BMPT and its variants are built on the chassis of a T-72 or a T-90 tank. The Russian brass has talked about building a Terminator 3 unit on the chassis of the T-14 Armada. However, given that only about 20 Armada tanks have ever been built, the Terminator 3 is unlikely to come to fruition anytime soon. The BMPT Terminator, like so much of Russia's supposedly most advanced warfighting assets, was initially absent in the invasion of Ukraine. The reasons for this are not known, but given that Putin believed his military's own hype and expected the regime in Kyiv to fall in days, he might have believed that it was not necessary to risk one of Russia's best weapon systems, one which had already seen some sales abroad. When Kyiv did not fall and the Russian military found itself in a long war of attrition, things began to change. The first Terminator units were spotted in Ukraine in May 2022 in the Battle of Severodonetsk, three months after the invasion. The deployment of this unit was mostly psychological, although the BMPT Terminator's combat debut came at a moment when Russia was proving most effective in the war, there were far too few of these vehicles to meaningfully affect the outcome of military operations. Indeed, footage swirled of the BMPT Terminator needing to retreat from its first combat engagement. That would be far from the end of its story in Ukraine, however. The relatively few Terminator armored vehicles have performed better than Russia's main battle tank fleet which has taken terrible casualties in the face of Ukrainian resistance. Some Russian military bloggers have even implored the Kremlin to replace the outdated T-72 tank with Terminator units. In stark contrast to Russia's traditional tanks, which have often been blown sky-high thanks to their ammunition storage design, the BMPT Terminator has taken few casualties. The BMPT Terminator does not have the same design flaw as Russia's main battle tanks, giving it increased survivability which may be one of the reasons it was able to retreat to safety in May 2022. According to some of the military bloggers, the Terminator has proven formidable in urban and forested environments in Ukraine. The survivability dichotomy between the Terminator and its main battle tank comrades played out after the former's deployment in Ukraine. Although deployed only in small numbers, the first confirmed kill of a BMPT Terminator came in February 2023, nine months after the unit's initial entry into the war meaning that these units had survived until then. The BMPT Terminator's design seems well-suited for modern warfare. Russia's always emphasized its tank forces, but tank-on-tank -tank combat has proven rare in Ukraine. Indirect fire, especially with the help of drones, has been the norm in Ukraine. Drones and other precision strikes make it far easier to spot tanks and shoot them indirectly over great distances, long before they ever get into range for a traditional tank duel. The death of the tank so often spoken of in military circles, has proven far from the case in Ukraine though, despite the relative lack of traditional tank combat there. Tanks remain useful for storming enemy positions, but the traditional tank gun is less suited for this purpose. After all, if tank-on-tank -tank combat is becoming rarer, tank turrets loaded with rounds to take out other tanks might not be so optimal. This is where the BMPT Terminator has seemed to shine. Footage taken of the Terminator vehicles in Ukraine seems to show them performing well in multi-purpose rapid assault roles. Video footage has also shown Terminator vehicles fighting well at night. In July 2023, Russia's Terminator tank took part in action near Avdiivka, in what may have been part of a staging operation for Russia's offensive toward that settlement later in the year. Russian sources claim that during a night engagement, a Terminator fired 400 high-explosive fragmentation and armor-piercing shells at Ukrainian targets four kilometers away. So, how has Ukraine dealt with Russian Terminator vehicles, which have proven among them more effective in the conflict? Has the BMPT Terminator lived up to the hype that some of the Russian military bloggers have assigned to it? Ukraine scored its first confirmed kill of a BMPT Terminator in February 2023, when an artillery unit scored a direct hit on one in Kremina in Luhansk Oblast. The gunners attacked a Terminator that had been sitting idly on a forest road. The unit may have been damaged or had mechanical difficulties before then. The damage to this unit was total. The artillery shell struck the vehicle's ammunition magazine, indicated by the fireball in the blast. Ukraine has also demonstrated its ability to be more innovative in the ways it destroyed the Terminator tanks. 
The next confirmed combat loss of a BMPT Terminator came in August 2023 near the town of Spartak in Donetsk Oblast. There, Ukraine once again proved its prowess in drone warfare. Ukraine Special Forces Group Alpha posted a video showing a swarm of small, grenade-bearing, first-person view drones chasing down and assaulting one of Russia's Terminator tanks. The Terminator was at least immobilized after the action and needed to be towed by a nearby T-80 main battle tank. That tank was also hit in a drone strike. This incident lacked the fireball that accompanied the Terminator destroyed in the February attack, so the unit may have been salvageable. Ukrainian forces nevertheless gloated about the incident, saying on X, formerly Twitter, this rare model of enemy weaponry burned down after only a few hits from kamikaze drones. They tried to pull out the downed Terminator with a T-80 tank, but it was also hit. FVP drones have proven to be some of Ukraine's best anti-vehicle weapons, and they are cheap, costing only about $5,000 each. Their cheapness and ease of control with a virtual reality headset has made them popular on both sides of the conflict. The Terminator may have been designed to shoot at upward targets, but it was clearly not prepared to shoot at multiple fast-moving targets like FPV drones. The vehicle may not have been put permanently out of commission, but given that only perhaps 10 of them have been deployed to Ukraine, the loss of even one is a great blow to Russia. The third incident came in September 2023, on the 27th of the month. Ukrainian soldiers, this time in the mutant group, again employed FPV drones, again near Spartak, to damage or destroy a BMPT Terminator. The vehicle had used an infamous cope cage for added protection, but that was not enough to prevent the drones from going to town on it. Given the timing and vicinity of the incident, some observers wondered whether this vehicle was the same as the Terminator damaged in August, but there was no way to verify this. A PREM recovery vehicle was also damaged in the attack. Again, there was no fireball indicating that its ammunition had been torched, but the vehicle was at least temporarily out of commission, and Ukraine proved the concept of attacking Russia's Terminator tanks with drones. Repeat successful drone attacks show one of the Terminator's weaknesses and the weakness of other contemporary armored vehicles. The BMPT Terminator might be armed to the teeth, but it is not designed to hit such fast-moving small targets. The Terminator's engineers were reportedly trying to improve the vehicle's air defense systems as early as 2018, but these improvements were meant to be against helicopters, especially ones capable of firing missiles from distances of up to 5 kilometers. Drone defenses were not mentioned. The Terminator tank comes with other weaknesses too. The vehicle might have a lot in the way of offense, but defensively it is lacking. In contrast to the turret of a main battle tank, a Terminator's turret is much more lightly armored. The vehicle's missiles are armored to protect against explosive fragments and shrapnel, but that's about it. The hull might protect the crew, but the top of the vehicle is vulnerable. Concentrated small arms fire on the turret of a Terminator tank would be sufficient to imperil its weapons. The design is particularly vulnerable to something like a javelin, which attacks its target on a downward trajectory to avoid the most heavily armored features of the tank, or in this case, the BMPT Terminator. Another problem that the Terminator tank has is it lacks the situational awareness that a combined arms approach to warfare would have, no matter how advanced its sensors are. The United States learned through experience in Iraq that armored vehicles cannot replace the situational awareness and rapid response time of infantry support. It's a lesson that Russia clearly has not learned in Ukraine. Although Soviet gear and doctrine still permeates much of the Ukrainian military, it is rapidly absorbing the lessons in doctrine and training afforded by its Western allies, and Ukraine has had much better success in integrating infantry and other arms with its armor than its Russian opponents have. The two Ukrainian drone attacks against Terminator tanks serve as a good example. Russia's overall failure of giving its Terminator and other armored vehicles adequate infantry support is one of the reasons why it has lost so many of them in the conflict. The Terminator tank escaped to this fate for a time, but two incidents in two months demonstrate that Ukraine is adapting to the presence of this vehicle. Interestingly, one of the ways that Ukraine originally sought to adapt to the Russian Terminator tank was to build a model of its own. These vehicles are known as the Stras, or Sentinel. In October 2017, a Ukrainian company called Zytomir Armored Plant unveiled an armored vehicle similar to Russia's Terminator tank. It used the chassis of a T-64 main battle tank and had a turret that also looked like the Terminator's. The turret boosted twin ZTM-2 30mm autocannons, 
a Ukrainian adaptation of the Soviet ZA-42. Two PKT 7.62mm machine guns served as secondary weapons. The Sentinel also came packed with four anti-tank guided missile launchers, with two mounted on the side of each turret. There was also an AG-17 30mm automatic grenade launcher in the center on top of the turret. Three smoke grenade launchers were attached to the sides of the turret as well, giving the vehicle more concealability in the event that it came under attack. The Sentinel was designed for a crew of three men. The vehicle unveiled in 2017 had explosive reactive armor on its front and sides. The driver sat in the front at the center of the hull, with the other two crew members at the front of the turret. Each crew member was to have their own hatch. The driver had a periscope, and the top of the turret was mounted with a video monitor, laser rangefinder, and electronic systems. However, despite these seemingly impressive features, Ukraine never put these vehicles into mass production and has not used them in its fight against the Russian invaders. Information on why it chose not to pursue the Sentinel is a little elusive, but it could be because of NATO training. Since Western doctrine insists on close cooperation between infantry and armor, while Russian doctrine tends to solve all problems with tanks and artillery, Ukraine might have no longer seen a need for the production of an expensive tank when it could focus on cheaper, more rapid-fire support systems for its traditional tanks, like anti-armor infantry and drones. Given the limited number of BMPT Terminator tanks that Russia's built, the vehicle's vulnerable turret, and its now demonstrated weakness to drones, it may be that Ukraine was wise to avoid what could have been a costly rabbit hole. The jury is still out on the Terminator's overall effectiveness on the modern battlefield compared to a traditional tank, but the idea promoted by some of the Russian military bloggers that this vehicle would be a major boost for Russia's struggling effort in Ukraine appears to be just that, an idea. What do you think about the BMPT Terminator tank? If it were produced in greater numbers, would it have been better luck on modern battlefields than Russia's main battle tank fleet? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts. This is Russia's next generation tank, the T-14 Armata, the latest tank from a country that has long prided itself on its armored assets. The T-14 is supposed to be armed with all the latest modern weapons, gadgets, and protective armor, in an ensemble meant to be a clear break from Soviet-era tank conventions which stretch back to World War II's revered T-34. Russia sells the T-14 as being in a league of its own, with capabilities that exceed all tanks of foreign manufacture. Indeed, the tank and the chatter around it gave Western observers the chills for a while. However, this facade is probably not all it's cracked up to be. Here's why Russia's next-generation T-14 Armata sucks when it actually comes to winning wars. Work on the project began in 2010 under the label Object 195. The first basic model of the new tank was introduced in July 2012. The Kremlin publicly unveiled this model as the T-14 Armata at a Victory Day parade in 2015, and the tank is supposed to enter full service by 2024. The Armata has, however, suffered multiple delays throughout its brief history. Thus far, only a single T-14 has been spotted in Ukraine. The sighting came in the village of Mijinskaya in Luhansk Oblast on October the 8th. The unit may have been placed there to serve as a command tank for other Russian armored assets. The Russians may also be deploying the T-14 tank as a psychological operation to increase morale on their own side after having experienced embarrassing defeats and to send a message to the Ukrainians that they have yet to best their top-line gear. But how top-line is the Armata really? Would it really make a difference in Ukraine and change Russia's ebbing fortunes if it were deployed in greater numbers? On the surface, the T-14 possesses formidable attributes. It has frontal base armor protection of over 900 mm in combination with Malachit Explosive Reactive Armor and the Afghani Active Protection System. If its armor system works as advertised, the T-14 should be able to take hits from any known tank munition, and with Ukraine's lack of advanced tanks, this could prove a problem should the Armata get deployed in large numbers. The T-14's armor is also supposedly resistant against handheld anti-tank weapons like the famous Javelin, which the Ukrainians have used to great effect against Russian armor in the war. The T-14 also boasts a separate self-contained 
self-contained crew capsule that is isolated from its magazine and specifically designed to protect the three-man operating team from anti-tank fire, maximizing its defensiveness and aiding its ability to act as a command unit. Other shielding mechanisms include active defense systems at the front of the vehicle to shoot down common anti-tank weaponry, such as RPGs. The tank also reportedly has stealth features, with its armor having a lower radar cross-section than other tanks in use. But that's not all. The Armata is a quick and maneuverable tank, with a top speed of 75 to 80 km per hour in both forward and reverse modes. In contrast, most of Russia's widely used tanks can only achieve a top speed of 4 km per hour while in reverse, making them easy to target with anti-tank fire. The T-14 has a remote-controlled turret that loads automatically with a 45-round magazine. The standard gun is a 125mm 2A82-1M smoothbore, but it can be upgraded to a 2A83 152mm gun. Either type can also fire laser-guided missiles. The T-14's secondary weapons include the Cord 12.7mm machine gun or PKTM 7.62mm machine gun. The Armata's engagement range exceeds any Western tank, as it can hit targets up to 12 kilometers away. Sounds incredible, right? Here's the thing, though. All of these defensive and offensive features sound impressive, but Russia has proven that it isn't exactly a trustworthy source of information about its own capabilities. In reality, the T-14 has shown itself to be lacking so far, and not all is as it seems. The tank's problems stretch back to its debut, when one of them broke down and had to be towed away for repairs during a rehearsal for a military parade in Red Square in 2015, which would have been one of its first public showings. This proved only the first of many embarrassments. Often those shortcomings included not being able to pay for or manufacture the tank at scale. An impressive weapon means little if you cannot produce it in the numbers needed to shift the balance of power on the battlefield. The only one T-14 has been spotted in Ukraine after nine months of war suggests a few problems for the Russians in actually using the tank. The T-14 has been plagued by numerous delays since its public debut in 2015. The Kremlin's initial plans to field 2,300 Armata tanks proved unaffordable and Russia needed to settle for a much smaller total. The Russian armed forces expected the first batch of nine in 2018, but the Kremlin moved the date back first to 2019 and then 2020. A 2020 report in The Diplomat stated that 132 Armatas would be delivered by 2022, but that has not happened either. It turns out that the company that manufactures the tank, Oral Vagonzavod, also had its fair share of problems. The company is 87 billion rubles in debt and needed to cut the pay of its workforce by 21% between 2019 and 2020. These financial problems may be a reason why only 20 finished T-14s exist as of 2021. The Armata's frequent glitches and production delays came before the hefty sanctions the international community levied in retaliation for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Such sanctions will make it even more difficult for Russia to obtain the materials it will need to manufacture the T-14's advanced electronics, among other systems. The T-14 may have all the high-tech features that Russia claims it has, but even if all of it was true and it all worked, it means little if the Russians cannot deploy them on the battlefield. The next-generation tank also means little if it's too expensive and becomes a white elephant, which may be the reason why Russia has been hesitant to use the T-14 in Ukraine until now. The Ukrainians have proven excellent tank killers and capturers in this war. The prospect of the T-14 falling into enemy hands must make the Kremlin take pause, and if you're too scared of losing a weapon system to deploy it, it's not exactly a useful tool. Indeed, because Russia has been unable or unwilling to produce the T-14 Armata at scale, it has instead used its resources to upgrade its older arsenal of tanks such as the T-72, T-80, and T-90A. There are other problems for the T-14 tank as well, ones which go beyond cost, manufacturing, and delivery. One of the reasons for the delays includes continual glitches in the T-14 software. These glitches came partly because of sanctions that the West imposed on Russia following its annexation of Crimea in 2014. Particularly, a major weakness inherent in the Armata is that its much-vaunted protective crew capsule cannot revolve like the gun turret can. The engineering arrangement means that the tank relies on optical systems and electronics to deliver visual information to the crew. That is not exactly ideal when you can't get your software right, and even if it were to check out out, how would the crew react to their electronics being taken out during a battle? Speaking of systems failure, some American Abrams crews who are familiar with the T-14 were not impressed with what they saw. They questioned the emphasis of its supposedly modern auto-loading cannon. When speaking in a 2018 report for Business Insider, they asked what would happen if something goes wrong in the middle of a battle and the automated loader stopped working. How much work would it take to get the breach open and get down in there? Since the self-isolated crew capsule is separate from the turret, the answer is it could take a lot of work. As the United States has seen with the F-35s and other expensive modern systems, sometimes Sometimes having the most cutting-edge technology means you sign up for a lot more things potentially going wrong, and if anything is true on a battlefield, many things will go wrong. No plan survives the first contact with the enemy.
Even if the T14's auto-loading system works perfectly, it faces another disadvantage. It is slow. Auto-loading may sound modern, but an American Abrams crew with a human loader can actually get shots off faster. They can usually fire their weapons in 5-second intervals at the maximum and more often than not under 4, according to Sergeant Emmett Fulgham, a tank gunner with 3rd Battalion 8th Cavalry Regiment who talked about the subject to the military publication Coffee or Die. In contrast, the T-14's auto-loader takes 10 seconds or more to load and fire, meaning that its prospective Western opponents can get 2 or 3 shots off for every one that the Armata gets. The Armata may have a longer range, but with such limited numbers and large load times, it may simply not be able to put enough fire down range to tilt the scale of a battle, especially when there will not be many Armatas to begin with. The Armata has supposedly seen limited action in the field, and results have not been encouraging. According to the reports in Chinese media, the T-14 underperformed in its subdued use in Syria. Chinese media blasted the Russians for promoting false combat conditions under which the tank took part, claiming there was no evidence for anything that they were saying. With such praise from his friends, Vladimir Putin must be wondering what his enemies think. For their part, rebel factions in Syria commented that they had not encountered the Russians' newest tank. Other information out of Syria suggests that the Armata's vaunted system of protection didn't work so well. Reporting from 2020 indicated that soldiers wielding anti-tank weapons hit three T-14s, with one of them being completely destroyed. If such reports are true, it is feasible that the Armata's defenses do not live up to the Kremlin's hype, and that advanced anti-tank systems like the American Javelin, British Enlaw, and Swedish AT-4 could destroy it, even if the crew in their isolated capsule compartment manages to survive the impact to the tank's turret and magazine. Perhaps this is the reason that only one Armata has been definitively spotted in Ukraine. Another problem that the T-14 faces is that foreign countries, even ones Russia has long had arms deals with like China, India, and Middle Eastern nations, don't seem eager to buy it. Russia has tried to sell the T-14 abroad, but it has found no buyers. The lack of foreign interest leaves Russia even more cash-strapped in developing it, since weapon R&D is expensive and foreign investments help to make the final product pay for itself. For example, robust foreign purchases of the F-35 Lightning II helped the United States share the burden in developing that infamously expensive platform. However, with the seeming lack of interest for Russia to buy one of its own assets and its design problems, other countries don't seem too keen on purchasing the Armata. China even claims that its next-generation VT-4 tank is superior to the Armata. The T-14 Armata's problems are large enough to make the Kremlin reconsider its investment in it. Another tank design, which reportedly lost out to the Armata in the 2000s called the Burlak, is now the subject of discussion in the Russian military. This tank is less revolutionary. Instead, it evolves on Russia's older tank technology to produce a vehicle nearly as good as the Armata. Whether the Burlak re-emerges and spells the doom of the T-14 project remains to be seen, but one thing is certain. The T-14 shows us that appearances can be deceiving and that most modern does not always mean most useful. But what do you think? Does the T-14 Armata have the potential to become the world's greatest tank? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Back in 2020, Putin made some big promises. By big promises, we mean one specific, armor-piercing, rapidly moving, supposedly impenetrable promise. You know what we're talking about, and it starts with a T and ends with a laser-guided missile explosion. The T-14 Armata. Putin vowed to manufacture this alleged Abrams killer, by far the strongest and most technically advanced Russian tank ever designed, in mass quantities. You can't say the guy doesn't dream big, but sometimes dreams turn into nightmares. And that's exactly what happened to the Russian dictator who is now facing an incomprehensible shortage of tanks on the battlefield in Ukraine. And we're not just talking about the T-14, which is more or less ghosting this war completely. The guy is running low on every kind of clanky, antiquated Soviet-era hardware and tanks you can think of. The Russian army is currently trying to fight off the latest and greatest Western tanks and IFVs, including American-made M1 Abrams, German-made Leopard 2s, and British-made Challengers, and they are failing at trying to get any real headway in these battles. Would things be different if Russia had more T-14 Armatas at its disposal? In an epic battle between the T-14 Armata and, say, the German Leopard 2, who would win? Let's lay down the stats and find out. But first, a quick review of the T-14 Armata's complicated backstory, filled with red flags that Putin clearly ignored to his own demise. In 2015, the Russian armed forces revealed the T-14 Armata, a highly secretive next-generation main battle tank based on the Armata Universal Combat Platform. 
The Universal Armata design was originally intended to serve as a starting point for the next generation of Russian Heavy Infantry Fighting Vehicles IFVs, and Armored Personnel Carriers AFVs. This was a common starting point among the world's strongest militaries in the 1970s and 1980s, but the Russians came to the game late, starting development on the Armata platform in 2009. The thought was that if you could build a modular next-generation tracked vehicle platform, you'd be able to slap all manner of mission-specific systems onto it according to the needs and dictates of the intended mission. Yes, you could have a powerful main battle tank, but you'd also have the basis of a fleet of combat engineering vehicles, air defense units, armored personnel carriers, tank support vehicles, and self-propelled artillery, if you wanted, ones that all run on the exact same engine, fuel, and spare parts. Ultimately, if you could pull it off, it would vastly simplify maintenance procedures and decrease production costs. But here's the problem. Mission modularity is touted as the one-stop solution to all your tactical, technological, engineering, and budgetary challenges. But in reality, Universal platforms can force designers to limit a system's maximum performance by imposing artificial, fiscal, and technological constraints in the name of efficiency and integration. It's okay when the extent of the modularity is limited to, say, the seats on an aircraft, which can easily be removed to make it a cargo versus a passenger transport. But when you scale it up, swapping turrets on a tank chassis to make it an indirect artillery platform in the spur of a moment, there's little chance a universal system will outperform a counterpart which has been expressly designed for the prescribed combat role. Like the rest of the West, Russia has veered away from making the Armata Universal Combat Platform the darling of its motorized ground forces, mostly because it can't anymore. When it was first announced, the T-14 sent the Western world into a frenzy. Could the existing Western main battle tanks hold their weight against the latest Russian offering? On paper, at least, it was close. They had similar armament, top speeds, and armor. With its isolated crew compartment and automated turret, the T-14 may have been able to better protect its operators. It had marginally better range, muzzle energy, fuel efficiency, and maintenance potential than even the American M1 Abrams. But the robust 40-year-old Abrams and Leopard designs with their modern suite of upgrade packages would almost certainly hold their own in a firefight. Which did not bode well for Russia, since by the time they announced the T-14, there were already 10,000 operable Abrams and more than 3,600 Leopard 2s produced and in use around the world. As it turned out, there wasn't much to worry about. The first batch of 12 Armata tanks was delivered in 2015. Despite plans to ultimately acquire 2,300 T-14 tanks by 2025, there are still virtually no Armatas in use throughout the Russian Armed Forces. As the Armata program was beset by production issues, financial problems, and trial delays, its initial acquisition was scaled back to just 100 experimental vehicles, a number that Russia has fallen well short of reaching. So what's the German Leopard 2's backstory? For one, it had a far more optimal service history since its inception in 1979. It was something of a surprise when the German military started designing the Leopard 2 just a few years after it had come out with the Leopard 1 which had only been in service for about a decade, a very short shelf life for a main battle tank. From the start, the Leopard 1 had been a staple of European defense, with more than 4,700 tanks and 1,741 utility and anti-aircraft variants produced. You can still find upgraded Leopard 1s out there in the wild if you travel to Greece, Turkey, Brazil, or Chile, but by and large, most Leopard-adopting militaries have adopted its more modern counterpart, the third-generation Leopard 2, from Poland to Singapore. Updating the Leopard 1 was a decision made in direct response to improvements in Soviet armor during the later stages of the Cold War. West Germany knew it occupied a strategically vital position on NATO's front lines with the Soviet Union. If the Soviets decided to attack, West Germany needed a competitive main battle tank to resist the threat. Fortunately, they succeeded in developing a tank that far outmatched its Soviet opponents. Ironically, the Leopard 2 began its life as a joint development program with the United States to develop a next-generation MBT. The MBT-70 program that eventually spawned the Leopard couldn't quite meet the requirements of either nation, so the US went off to work on the M1 Abrams while Germany returned to its Leopard 1 and began asking how they could take it to the next level. Under the management of Porsche engineers, the Germans concluded that the new platform could incorporate improved engine transmission upgrades, a coaxial autocannon, heavier rounds, extendable surveillance cameras, 
and an independent commander's periscope to improve the crew's situational awareness. While they were there, they decided to beef up the tank's main gun from 105 to the 120mm smoothbore the Leopard retains to this day. The West Germans wanted to see how they were doing so far, so in 1976, they sent a prototype to the US for inspection by American engineers. The Leopard was as agile, if not more, than the American prototype Abrams XM1 in development. They found the Leopard 2 and the XM1 were comparable in firepower and mobility, and that even though the Abrams could resist explosive kinetic energy penetration rounds slightly better, Leopard 2 crews were almost twice as well protected. The Leopard's engine was more reliable. It guzzled less gas, and it didn't have as large of a heat signature, even if it was noisier. The Leopard 2 hit the production line shortly after its American audition, having improved on its armor deficiencies. Like any MBT, it has undergone a series of regular systems upgrades that have improved its armor, survivability, firepower, and optics as technology has improved. There were a couple of baseline improvements over previous generations of MBTs that really set the Leopard 2 apart. It had blowout panels on the separator between the turret bustle, with its ready ammunition racks and the crew compartment. It had new thermal night sight systems, digital ballistic computers, improved fire extinguishing systems, improved frontal arc armor arrays, and side skirts that could add new ceramic and composite armor modular plating as required. The latest version of the Leopard is the 2A7, first released in 2014. A consistent string of upgrades have either been implemented or are scheduled to continue improving the platform ever since, which will be discussed in more detail later. Rheinmetall, the manufacturer of the Leopard and Abrams 120mm smoothbore guns, announced in 2015 that it would begin developing a new 130mm variant that would offer a 50% increase in performance in penetration. While Germany has announced the end of the Leopard's service life will likely come around 2030, and Germany and France are already jointly designing its replacement, the main ground combat system, there are more improvements to the Leopard 2A7 in the offing, including upgrades to the current L55 Cannon 120mm ammunition, as well as a new digital turret core system, situational awareness system, and an active protective system. The T-14 tank is capable in its own right. Coming in at a spry 55 tons, it is 12 tons lighter than the 67-ton Leopard 2. Powered by a turbocharged 1500-horsepower 12-speed automatic diesel engine, the T-14 is actually significantly faster on the road than the Leopard, capable of traveling 56 miles an hour to the Leopard's 43. Costing four to five million dollars per unit, the Russian offering is also much cheaper to produce, almost half the cost of the Leopard. It is slightly more maneuverable, has adjustable suspension, and claims to have an operational range of 310 miles, 30 more than the Leopard's 280. If anything, the T-14 may well prove to be a trendsetter. It was, after all, the world's first production tank with an unmanned turret, a design feature the latest generation prototype American Abrams X will replicate. It possesses a larger 125mm smoothbore cannon, an autoloader, reactive armor, and the Afghanit Active Protective System APS, that helps it mitigate the impact of ATGMs that have absolutely eviscerated thousands of T-90s, T-80s, and T-72s that used to form the backbone of the Russian army. The Armata's three-man crew store their rounds in a sealed turret compartment separate from the cockpit. Likewise, the power plant, autoloader, and cockpits are sealed against nuclear, biological, and fire threats, something the Leopard's crew can also boast. Something unique about the T-14 is that it has a merged engine transmission unit that can be swapped in 30 minutes in the field and, in future variants, may be equipped with a massive 152mm gun, which can fire guided missiles capable of shattering armor twice as thick as the Leopard's. But speaking of unique features, the Leopard has a few tricks up its own turret. Modern combined operations are undertaken across a variety of terrains and geographic features, waterways and rivers among them. The interior of the Leopard 2 can be sealed, waterproofed, and equipped with a snorkel enabling the vehicle to traverse bodies of water taller than the tank itself. If it needs to, the crew can have up to 12 hours of life support in this sealed configuration, giving its occupants ample protection against the worst chemical and nuclear threats it might encounter on the battlefield. If the temperature rises above 180 degrees, automatic firefighting systems will engage to put the fire out. 
In terms of armor protection, defense estimates figure that the Leopard 2 had the equivalent protection of 1840 to 2920 mm of armor against kinetic energy projectiles and 2700 to 4370 mm of armor protection against chemical explosive rounds. The Leopard 2A6 went even farther, improving the crew survivability with protection equivalents of 5,890 mm to 7,800 mm of armor versus kinetic penetrators, and 9,000 to 11,500 mm of armor versus chemical explosive rounds. Leopard crews can feel safe driving over a variety of IEDs and mines with robust belly armor. Spore liners inside the hull prevent the deadly fracturing of internal armor plates when an explosive projectile hits the external armor but does not penetrate it, something that can actually incapacitate or kill a crew without leaving much of a visible trace on the exterior of the vehicle. The Leopard 2 can fire several different types of rounds. The German DM-33 discarding Sabot anti-tank round would be one of the most common in a head-to-head -head matchup, capable of penetrating 960 mm of steel armor at a range of 2,000 meters. The Leopard 2A7's new L55 cannon barrel is longer than its predecessor, giving ammunition improved penetrating power. The German tank can fire Leihat anti-tank guided missiles up to 3.6 miles away through the main gun, something the Armata allegedly claims it can do up to a distance of 5 miles, which could be the deciding factor in a one-on-one -on -one tank duel. In terms of capacity, the Leopard houses 42 rounds inside the crude turret. 15 additional rounds on the left side of the turret bustle, and 27 stored rounds in a specially protected hull magazine. The Armata, for its part, can hold 45 rounds. Both tanks have an array of 12.7 and 7.62mm machine guns in addition to their main guns for suppressive fire against infantry and smaller mechanized targets. Next generation sensors and optics are the norm in both models, but this is where the proven Leopard shines. It has a stabilized optical periscope for day and night operations, one that integrates fiber optic gyros, laser rangefinders, image fusion functioning, daylight cameras, and a thermal imaging device. The Leopard's gunner station incorporates a stabilized main sight and an auxiliary targeting telescope, while the driver can maneuver the tank into position using the tank's built-in night vision and thermal drive systems. If the Armata actually existed, we would find a capable foe, it possesses multispectral sights with laser rangefinders, thermals, and wide-angle cameras offering its crew 360-degree situational awareness. Its automated fire control system uses an advanced battlefield management system to analyze targeting data using the tank's built-in muzzle reference system and range sensors. This would certainly give the crew a leg up, as long as all the systems could be kept in good working order. The T-14's turret uses electrical armament stabilization and can fire programmable ammunition, like the gun-launched anti-tank guided missiles previously noted, expressly designed to destroy tanks and even helicopters. It's also worth noting that the T-14 is networked for guidance with other T-14s. They can be aided by a drone cable attachment that can be used indefinitely to distinguish targets using day or night vision, infrared, and add distance and target guidance data. This means if one tank's drone sees a target, the others will too. The Armata, as you can tell, is a tank purpose-built for the digital age. Good luck killing its crew, too. Its forward-based three-man crew are tightly cocooned in a futuristic steel capsule developed by Russian scientists to be 15% lighter than normal steel, yet withstand insanely heavier blast and heat ratings. Russian engineers wrapped this reinforced steel crew compartment in layers of classified composite ceramic plating. Russian engineers took things a step further. The forward position of the tank boasts a revolutionary Malekit dual explosive reactive armor system that can offset the impact of an RPG or anti-tank round in the front, sides, and top of the tank. In the rear, bar armor adds a few additional inches of potentially life-saving buffer space between the point of impact and the rear armor itself. Like most modern MBTs, the T-14 utilizes an APS system with five rocket launchers on either side of the tank that comes in two versions, hard and soft kill versions. Hard kill systems intercept and disable incoming munitions with projectiles of their own, while soft kill systems interfere with the electronic guidance or stabilization mechanisms of incoming rounds using things like laser dazzlers. The Russian-designed Afghanit system is the first in the world to incorporate both in a single system. 
using millimeter wave radar to target a variety of enemy rounds, including kinetic energy penetrators and tandem charge weapons, like the US manufactured Javelin. It's not been proven to work 100% of the time, but it's pretty good, analysts believe, at deflecting and destroying artillery shells and unguided rockets that are common on the modern battlefield, and interfering with ATGM guidance systems. Some Russians even say it can protect T-14 crews against the depleted uranium kinetic penetrators in common use among American tank crews, but we'll believe that when we see it. Along those lines, there are almost more unknowns than knowns surrounding the T-14 project, like whether it has actually participated in war games or live fire events, whether the 55-ton tank could actually achieve the same level of survivability as the sturdier Leopard, or whether its autoloader system is as reliable as claimed. What we do know is that there is a reason American tank crews rely on good old quality German engineering and precision by adapting the exact same turret and barrel configuration as the Leopard 2. The Leopard 2 systems can keep its gun leveled no matter what terrain it is traversing, even if it's on a hilly terrain or crossing a busy road. After firing, the barrel snaps back to its initial position in the blink of an eye. Hold my beer, T-14, literally. There's a famous promotional video showing a Leopard 2 holding a stein of German beer on the tip of its turret while it casually launches itself over an obstacle course, and as you might expect, not a drop spills out. As far as we know, the T-14 has more vertical and horizontal recoil, something you don't see on the Leopard, and is slightly less stable than the German model which could delay the target acquisition for its next firing. Ultimately, the Leopard has slightly heavier armor, but the Armata is faster, can travel farther, and is much cheaper to produce. Though apparently not cheap enough for the Russian MOD, it also has an autoloader with a heavier primary gun effective up to 5 kilometers. Using its 3U BK-21 Sprinter ATGMs, that range increases up to 12 kilometers. Both tanks have not, as yet, faced advanced tanks of their same generation in combat. Yes, the T-14 takes a lot of flack. We laugh because the tank broke down in its first public outing at the 2015 Moscow Victory Day Parade. I'm sure Putin would bite your arm off for a mechanically challenged T-14 to parade around these days. He could only drum up a single T-34 for this year's iteration, even though the decision to do so was likely motivated by legitimate security concerns. Still, in a hypothetical one-on-one -on -one battle that blatantly ignores today's geopolitical realities, the fact of the matter is that the Russian tank incorporates and surpasses many of the design features that make the Leopard 2 as great as it is. The armored crew capsule and automated turret offer greater protection and lethality. Its next-generation APS system, high-fidelity sensors, and computer targeting would lend it marked but not decisive advantage. But the fact that the existing Leopard is a time-tested main battle tank of over 40 years with a formidable base platform that will be continually improved upon and upgraded through 2030 is a huge mark in its favor. Only the German government and certain foreign buyers know what kind of next-generation equipment has found its way into the Leopard 2A7+, so it's impossible to know how it would fare in a fight. Already capable of matching up against the T-14 Armata, the fact remains that the price of upgrading existing and already manufactured Leopards with next-generation technology is far cheaper than producing a new T-14, something Russia can't even dream of as the economic and military consequences of its ill-planned invasion of Ukraine mount. In the end, the accuracy of rangefinders, sensors, and targeting computers would most likely determine the outcome of this tank duel. As one commentator noted, Small differences in lethality will likely matter less if one tank is able to see the other, while the other cannot detect at similar ranges. The tank that can find, target, and hit the other from the longer range is likely to prevail in any kind of war engagement. It would be rare to actually find ourselves in a scenario where both tanks are hunting the other. With the ubiquity of drones and aerial surveillance, tank battles a la Kursk have become relics of a bygone era. Even if the T-14 boasts greater reach, with its laser-guided rounds and rate of fire with its automatic loading mechanism, it wouldn't matter as much as we might like to think. Isolated and unsupported as most Russian tanks have been in Ukraine, the T-14 would be an easy and favorable target to Ukrainian infantry, who would just as soon engage it with a far cheaper Javelin or AT-4 than a Leopard of their own. The true difference maker, however, in a fight between the Leopard 2 and the T-14 Armata would likely not be in the tank's technology, armament, or munitions, but in the quality of its crews. And you can take that to the bank. This is where the Leopard, or any modern Western tank for that matter, would truly shine. 
operated by competent, well-trained crews with effective NCOs, something the Russians no longer have, tanks are only as good as the humans inside them. With a strong emphasis on combined and joint operations, traditional Leopard tank crews would almost certainly benefit from NATO air superiority, better intelligence, and integration with remote assets and battlefield management internal systems, not to mention far greater interoperability with other NATO standard vehicles. Ukraine may lack much air superiority, but it will still be receiving training on how to properly employ them from some of the best instructors in the world. Technology and resilient systems matter on the modern battlefield and will continue to matter in the future, but where these factors fail, discipline, cohesion and training will take care of the rest. Until the Armata actually enters the production line, something that for Russia may never even happen, as recent reports indicate that in the light of recent military setbacks, it has halted its 20 trillion ruble program altogether. One-on-one -on -one showdowns between it and the Leopard 2 will likely remain confined to our imagination. But if you had to pick one, who would you go with? Let us know in the comments. The American M1 Abrams is regarded as the most powerful main battle tank in the world today. Although there have been many challengers for the top spot over the years, the Abrams has held the title since it was first introduced in 1980. There is no question that many countries produce excellent tanks. Much attention is given to the United Kingdom and Germany for their tank designs. But other countries such as France, Israel, Japan, and South Korea produce high-quality tanks as well. One country that does not get much attention is China. And that's a mistake, because China has developed a tank that people need to know about. In this video, we'll be comparing the Abrams to the Chinese Type 99. We'll explore the capabilities of the Type 99, examining its design, range, armor, and firepower. We'll look at its strengths and weaknesses and see how it stacks up against the American Abrams. Our analysis is based on the most advanced variants of each. The Abrams M1A2 SEP V3 and the Type 99A2. Historically, China is lagged behind the rest of the world in terms of main battle tank designs. Early on, it seemed unnecessary for China to design its own tanks. It simply purchased them from the Soviet Union, which was more than willing to sell them. When the Soviet Union released the T-54, China was very impressed with its capabilities. It didn't take much time before the Chinese government approached the Soviets about possibly setting up a factory, building it themselves. The Soviet Union agreed. At first, these Chinese manufactured T-54 used all Soviet parts. It wasn't too long before China realized it could manufacture these parts on its own. The result was the Type 59, which was simply a Type 54 with a new name. The Type 59 was China's first mass-produced tank. With some 10,000 built between 1958 and 1985, it was the backbone of Chinese armor until the early 2000s. It's also quite famous, but not for the reason you might think. Have you ever heard of Tank Man? No, he's not a superhero, but a man with two shopping bags who stopped an entire column of Type 59s in 1989. The incident took place shortly after the Chinese military violently put down a mass protest in Beijing's Tiananmen Square. The tanks were traveling down a broad, empty street when Tank Man stepped in front of them and refused to let them pass. Each time the lead tank tried to maneuver around the man, he would shift where he was standing and block the tank again. At one point, Tank Man climbed on top of the lead T-59 and argued with the tank's commander before getting down. He continued to block the street, but was eventually escorted off the road by some bystanders. The whole incident, which lasted about five minutes, was caught on video and quickly went viral. After the development of the Type 59, China spent the next few decades trying to develop a tank of its own. First came the T-69, followed by the T-79, the Type 88, and the Type 90, among others. Many of these were not particularly good, and the People's Liberation Army was not shy about saying so. Despite all its efforts, China simply could not design a tank that was on par with the rest of the world. That changed with the development of the Type 99. The Type 99 is a third-generation Chinese main battle tank. It incorporates many features found on modern battle tanks, including composite armor, an advanced fire control system, and a computer-stabilized main gun. The appearance of the Type 99 is quite interesting. It's a mixture of both Russian and Western design concepts. The main hull is similar to the Russian T-72, while its angular welded turret seems to have been inspired by the German Leopard II. The hull of the Type 99 is slightly less than 8 meters long and 3.5 meters wide. It has a height of 2.2 meters. Like many main battle tanks, it can handle gradients as much as 60% with a side slope of 40%. 
It can cross trenches as wide as 3 meters, all very standard for a main battle tank. In terms of weight, the Type 99 is lighter than most, weighing in at 54 tons. In comparison, the German Leopard 2 and the British Challenger 2 are approximately 62 tons. Meanwhile, the American Abrams comes in at a whopping 73 tons. It carries a crew of three, a commander, a gunner, and a driver. The driver sits in a compartment located in the center front hall. The gunner and the commander are located in the turret, with the gunner on the left and the commander on the right. Since the Type 99 uses an autoloader, a fourth crewman is not necessary. For propulsion, the Type 99 uses a 150 HB turbocharged 1500 horsepower diesel engine, which is very similar to the German MB873 engine used on the German Leopard 2. Given its powerful engine and its lighter weight, the tank can reach speeds up to 50 miles per hour. Off-road, the Type 99 travels at 37 miles per hour. Its fuel tank holds 330 gallons of diesel fuel and has a range of about 600 kilometers, about 370 miles. Earlier versions of the Type 99 used a manual transmission, but the latest version uses an 8-gear CH1000 hydraulic mechanical semi-automatic transmission. It has six forward gears and two reverse gears. The torsion bar suspension consists of six rubber-tied road wheels with a rear drive sprocket and a front idler. Hydraulic shock absorbers are located on the first, second, and sixth wheels on both sides. Everyone loves to talk about firepower, and we're not going to hold out on you. Let's see what it has. The Type 99 is equipped with a ZPT-98 125mm smoothbore main gun that can fire an impressive 10 rounds per minute using its carousel-type autoloader system. Shells can also be loaded manually, but at the rate of only one or two rounds per minute. This is because the commander or the gunner must load shells in addition to their main responsibilities. The Type 99 carries a total of 41 shells, 22 of which are stored in the autoloader. It can fire several different types of shells, including armor-piercing depleted uranium penetrator rounds, heat rounds, and HE frag rounds. It can hit targets up to 5,000 meters away, depending on the type of ammunition used. The Type 99 also carries four anti-tank missiles that are fired through the main gun at ranges of up to 5 kilometers. The missile is a Chinese-manufactured Russian 9M-119M Reflex anti-tank guided missile with a high-explosive anti-tank warhead that can hit both tanks and low-flying helicopters. In addition to its main gun, the Type 99 has a coaxial 7.62mm machine gun and a 12.7mm heavy machine gun mounted above the commander hatch on the top of the turret. Its fire control system includes a laser rangefinder and an automatic target tracking system that can lock on a fast-moving target and provide an accurate firing solution. The gunner's primary sight has a magnification capability and is equipped with a thermal imaging system. The ballistic computer on the Type 99 uses information from several systems and even considers environmental factors to increase the probability of a first hit. It's believed that the Type 99's fire control system is superior to that found on the Russian T-72 and possibly better than the T-90s. The armor on the Type 99 is comprised of all-welded steel, plus composite armor over the front hull and turret. Its side skirts also incorporate composite armor. Very little is known about the materials used in the composite armor and its effectiveness. Like other tanks in this class, the Type 99 can be fitted with reactive armor panels to deflect incoming rounds and missile warheads. In addition to its physical armor, the Type 99 also possesses an active protection system to engage incoming threats. The GL-5 active protection system is of Chinese design and consists of four radars and 12 launchers. The system provides 360-degree horizontal coverage and 20-degree vertical coverage. If the GL-5 detects an incoming anti-tank missile, it fires two high-explosive fragmentation rounds that provide a wide spray of metal shards similar to that of a shotgun. The active protection system has a range of 10 meters but cannot protect the tank from top attacks, such as an incoming drone or manned portable anti-tank missiles, such as the American-made Javelin. Now that we've looked at the Type 99, it's time to take a peek at the M1 Abrams and its capabilities. The M1 Abrams was first introduced in 1980 as a replacement for the venerable M60, which had served as the backbone of American armor throughout most of the Cold War. The American military later introduced the M1A1 and M1A2, both of which remain in service to this day. It's estimated that there are approximately 4,500 M1A1s and M1A2s in active service, 
with another 3,500 in storage. The original M1 was retired in 1996. Throughout the years, the United States has significantly upgraded both the M1A1 and the M1A2 to keep up with advances in technology and the realities of the modern battlefield. The most advanced version of the Abrams is the M1A2 SEP V3. SEP stands for System Enhanced Package. The SEP V3 is the third generation of the upgrade program. It's preceded by the original SEP and the SEP V2. The US Army launched the SEP program in 1999 as a way to provide standardized upgrades for both the M1A1 and M1A2. Not only could the M1A2 be upgraded with the system enhanced package, but older M1A1s could be modified to become an M1A2 with the same system enhanced package. Although the M1A1 remains a potent battlefield asset, it is showing its technological age as new generations of main battle tanks are released by other nations. Approximately 1,000 M1A1s are undergoing the M1A2 SEP modification. The SEP 3 is 9.7 meters long and 3.7 meters wide. It stands 2.44 meters tall with a ground clearance of 0.43 meters. The Abrams can cross trenches as wide as 3 meters and is capable of moving forward on terrain with as much as a 60% grade and a side slope of 40%. The Abrams is a very heavy tank. And when we say heavy, it's really heavy. Coming in at 73 tons, the Abrams is significantly heavier than Germany's Leopard 2, which weighs 68 tons, and the British Challenger 2, which weighs 64 tons. Its heaviness is largely due to the tank's impressive armor protection, which we'll talk about shortly. The Abrams carries a crew of four, including a commander, a driver, a gunner, and a loader. The driver is positioned at the front of the tank, directly below the main gun, and uses a motorcycle-style handlebar to steer the tank. Acceleration is achieved by twisting the hand grip, again like a motorcycle. The brake pedal is located on the floorboard just like a car. The tank is powered by a 1500 horsepower Honeywell AGT 1500 multi-fuel turbine engine that's whisper quiet. Although the engine is optimized for jet fuel, it can also run on gasoline and diesel. The US Army typically uses jet fuel, but has reportedly begun to use diesel for refueling purposes. The Abrams is a true gas guzzler. It burns 392 liters or 1.67 gallons per minute while traveling cross-country and 38 liters or 10 gallons per hour when idling. The Abrams also has a compact single-cylinder diesel engine that serves as an auxiliary power system. This small fuel-efficient secondary engine can generate 10 kilowatts of electricity, which is sufficient to power the tank's key components, including its turret, while the main engine is not running. The Abrams has a 6-speed Allison X1100 3B hydrokinetic automatic transmission, four of which propel the tank forward and two in reverse. Its running gear includes seven road wheels with the drive sprocket at the rear and the idler at the front. Rotary shock absorbers are located at the first, second, and seventh wheel stations. The fuel tank holds 500 gallons, giving the tank a range of approximately 264 miles. It can reach speeds of 42 miles per hour on roadways and 30 miles per hour cross country. Technically, the Abrams can achieve higher speeds, but its engine is governed due to the high risk of damage to the drivetrain. In terms of firepower, the Abrams carries an M256 120mm smoothbore cannon and 42 rounds of ammunition. It can fire several different types of shells, including armor piercing and high explosive rounds. It even supports canister shells to deal with infantry units at short ranges. A recent addition to the Abrams is its ability to fire advanced multi-purpose shells that can be programmed to explode in different ways, such as on contact, in the air, or on delay. This is accomplished through a highly specialized ammunition data link. The Abrams can fire up to 8 rounds per minute, even though the loading process is manual. The 120mm main weapon has an effective range of up to 4,000 meters and is highly accurate, even while the tank is on the move. It accomplishes this through its computer-stabilized cannon, an advanced ballistic fire control system, and its exceptional vision technology. The Abrams uses a cutting-edge fire control system that can calculate firing solutions based on angle, ammunition type, and range to target. It gathers a vast amount of information, everything from air and ammunition temperature to barrel droop caused by barrel heat and gravitational pull. In addition to its 120mm main gun, the Abrams also has a 50 caliber machine gun above the commander hatch, a coaxial 7.62 machine gun, and a 7.62 machine gun located above the loader. 
The Abrams carries a six-tube smoke grenade launcher to obscure the battlefield. It can also generate smoke from its engine compartment by injecting a small amount of diesel fuel into the tank's exhaust system. The Abrams has superior sighting technology. It possesses a third-generation thermal imaging system for the gunner and the commander that uses long- and mid-wave infrared technology. This system provides 10x magnification of narrow views and 3x magnification of wide-field views. The gunner also has a Cole Morgan Model 939 auxiliary sight with magnification of 8x. The driver has an impressive picture-in-picture -picture digital display and advanced night vision technology that provides a 20-degree field of view. The tank also has a position navigation system that allows the commander to identify the tank's location relative to other friendly units. The Abrams has long been known for its incredible armor protection. In fact, the Abrams may be the best protected modern battle tank in existence today. It's a top-secret variant of British Chobham armor technology, a special arrangement of metal plates, composite ceramic blocks, and open space. It also incorporates a layer of graphite-coated depleted uranium mesh. The ceramic blocks and depleted uranium mesh allow the Abrams to absorb vast amounts of kinetic energy. The open spaces within the armor provide room to disperse metal shards and hot gases. Its underside is also armored to protect against mines and IEDs. The tank's suspension, wheel sprockets, and tracks are protected by an armored side skirt. The interior of the turret is lined with Kevlar, improving the chances of crew survivability from metal shrapnel if the main armor does not fully absorb an incoming projectile. The Abrams stores its ammunition in a protected compartment within the turret. This compartment is equipped with blowout panels to direct blasts away from the vehicle and crew in the event of an ammunition explosion. In addition to physical armor, the Abrams also possesses the AN VLQ-12 Crew Duke Counter IED system. This system can electronically block enemy radio transmissions used to detonate roadside bombs, protecting the tank from improvised explosive devices. So, now that we have a look at both tanks, which one is better? To answer this question, we're going to compare these two tanks using three different categories – maneuverability, armament, and protection. Let's start with maneuverability. The Type 99 is extremely fast by today's standards. It can achieve speeds of 50 mph on open roads and 37 mph when traveling on terrain. The Abrams is nowhere near as fast, with a road speed of 42 mph and 30 mph cross-country. That's quite a difference. When it comes to range, the Type 99 far outpaces the Abrams. It has a much smaller fuel tank than the Abrams, but can travel upwards of 600 kilometers or 370 miles without refueling. Despite having a much larger fuel tank, the gas-guzzling Abrams can only travel 425 kilometers or 264 miles between refuelings. One advantage the Abrams has over the Type 99 is that it has a multi-fuel engine. It can run on jet fuel, gasoline, and diesel, giving it great flexibility. The Type 99, however, only uses diesel. Given its speed and range between fuelings, the Type 99 is significantly better than the Abrams in this category. Winner, Type 99. So, who wins when it comes to armament? The M1A2 Abrams has a 120mm smoothbore cannon with an effective range between 3,000 and 4,000 meters. It can fire a variety of different shells, including anti-personnel canister rounds. The Abrams also has an ammunition data link, which can be used to program multi-purpose rounds to explode in different ways – on contact, in the air, or on delay. The Type 99 has a 125mm main gun with an effective range of up to 5,000 meters, 1,000 meters more than the Abrams. Not only that, but the Type 99 also carries four long-range anti-tank missiles that can hit targets up to 5 kilometers away. The Abrams does not possess a long-range anti-tank missile. While range is important, it's not as important as being able to hit and kill targets on the first attempt. The United States is known for developing cutting-edge technology, and while China is no slouch in this area, it is more known for its ability to manufacture high-tech systems. Also, when it comes to developing tanks, China has historically used aspects of Russian and, to a lesser extent, Western design features. Unfortunately, sometimes these features are obsolete by the time development is completed. So, it's safe to say that the Abrams, especially its acquisition and targeting systems, is much more technologically advanced than the Type 99. Today, the first hit is usually the last hit because of the capabilities of modern munitions. We believe that the Abrams has a higher first hit capability 
despite being outranged by the Type 99. Winner? Abrams. So far, it's a draw. Which tank will win when it comes to protection? This is a difficult category to assess. We know very little about the materials used in the Type 99's composite armor, and there's no information regarding its effectiveness. We do know quite a bit about the composite armor on the Abrams, especially the fact that it has a layer of depleted uranium mesh that's coated with graphite, making it more difficult to penetrate. This certainly is an important difference because it's unlikely the Type 99 uses materials that are as effective against incoming threats. The Abrams also has a passive counter IED system, which is incredibly important for low intensity conflicts. The difference in weight is also something else to consider. The Type 99 weighs 54 tons, while the Abrams is 73 tons. All that weight has to go somewhere, and in the case of the Abrams, it's the heavy armor it carries. Before we go ahead and award this category to the Abrams, we need to pause for a second to talk about the active protection system available on the Type 99. In the not-so-distant past, the biggest threat to a tank on the battlefield was another tank. Over the last decade, manned portable anti-tank missiles have become a major feature on the modern battlefield, which has changed everything. As the war in Ukraine has shown, these anti-tank missiles pose so much of a threat that tanks can only engage enemy units from a distance. In effect, tanks have become infantry support vehicles. The fact that the Type 99 can automatically detect and disrupt incoming missiles through its active protection system is a huge advantage. Although the active protection system is pretty interesting, it doesn't change our opinion that the Abrams is much better protected. Winner? Abrams. Here's what it all boils down to. Although the Abrams is the superior tank, the Type 99 is much better than people realize. It simply does not receive the credit it deserves. China has made a giant leap forward with the Type 99 and has caught up to the rest of the world in terms of features. Countries need to start paying attention to the Type 99 because it's only going to get better. But what do you think? Has China caught up with the other modern battle tanks? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Everyone is terrified of Israel's Merkava tank, and here's why. The Merkava tank, which translates to chariot in Hebrew, is the main battle tank of the Israeli Defense Forces. Its development is a significant part of Israel's military history, showcasing the country's commitment to advanced technology and self-reliance in defense. The story of the Merkava begins in the early 1970s. Following the 1967 Six-Day War and the 1973 Yom Kippur War, Israel realized the importance of having a reliable and potent tank force. They had previously relied on purchased or modified tanks from other countries, but the decision was made to create a domestic tank that would suit their specific needs. The Merkava project was led by General Israel Tal, a prominent figure in the Israeli military, a veteran of World War II and Israel's wars in 1948, 67, and 73, Tal was one of the world's leading experts on armored doctrine. He had played a major role in Israel's victories in both the Six-Day and Yom Kippur wars by training Israeli gunners to fire from further away than either Egyptian or Syrian tanks could manage. Tal drew his inspiration for the Merkava from the lessons learned during those conflicts, envisioning a tank that prioritized crew safety had superior armor and firepower, but could still move with agility across the diverse terrains of Israel. One of the distinguishing features of the Merkava is its overall design, with the engine placed in the front, providing an additional layer of protection for the crew compartment at the back. This goes against the traditional tank design, where the engine is at the rear. The tank's structure is heavily armored, and it includes a unique compartment at the back for infantry soldiers, ammunition, or supplies. The Merkava also boasts advanced weaponry, including a powerful 120mm main gun, a secondary 7.62mm coaxial machine gun, another machine gun mounted on the right side of the turret roof, and an internally mounted 60mm breech-loaded mortar. The roof-mounted machine gun can be remotely aimed and fired by the commander from within the turret and traversed to full 360 degrees. Since its initial introduction, the Merkava has undergone several upgrades and iterations, each improving upon the last. The Merkava Mark I, the first version, was officially introduced into the Israeli military in 1979. The Mark II followed in the 1980s with better armor and improved systems. The 1990s saw the introduction of the Merkava Mark III, which had a more powerful engine, improved armor, and advanced fire control systems. 
The Makava Mark IV, introduced in the early 2000s, continued this trend of improvements, integrating even more advanced technology, better protection, and improved weaponry. In the decades since, Israel has amassed a store of over 2,220 Makava tanks, although a substantial portion of these are still older models. The Mark IV Barak is a so-called smart tank, equipped with state-of-the-art computer systems and sensors to assist the crew in targeting and navigation. Brigadier General Baruch Matsliach, former head of the Makava Tank Directorate, stated in 2017 that the main challenge facing armor today is the disappearing enemy, which arrives, attacks, and retreats within seconds. He told the Jerusalem Post then that man is not capable of processing all the information when it comes to the disappearing enemy. While comparing the sensors and computer in the Mark IV to the Waze navigation system for cars, he added that we understand that we need a real task computer in the tank to fuse all the information together, to present it to the tank commander, so he can be able to make only the most important decisions, so he can really see and identify the target and analyze the situation in order to make the decision to shoot or not. As a smart tank, the Mark IV has fused sensors and a task computer that presents the same information to both the crew inside the tank as well as to other tanks and vehicles present in the field. The simplification and sharing of intelligence and information via C4I, command control communications, computers, and intelligence, has been crucial for improving accuracy and timing. The Merkava tank has been an integral part of Israel's military operations since its introduction. It's seen action in various conflicts and has proven its effectiveness on the battlefield. Its emphasis on crew protection has also set a standard in tank design, influencing other military vehicles worldwide. The tank has evolved over decades, integrating advanced technology and innovative design features to meet the challenges of modern urban and desert warfare. The Makava's fire control system is known for its accuracy and advanced capabilities. It incorporates a range of sensors, laser rangefinders, and computer systems to calculate the optimal firing solution, ensuring high precision even while on the move. The tank's gunner and commander have advanced sights and thermal imaging, allowing for effective target acquisition and engagement under diverse conditions, including nighttime operations. The fire control system is also integrated with the tank's navigation system, providing real-time data and aiding in accuracy. The Makava's mobility is a key aspect of its performance, designed to navigate the diverse terrains of Israel from deserts to hilly regions. It is powered by a robust V12 diesel engine, providing a good power-to-weight ratio and ensuring rapid acceleration and high top speeds. The tank's advanced suspension system aids in maneuverability, and its wide tracks provide excellent traction, even in challenging conditions. The Makava's armor is another contributor to the tank's success, ensuring maximum protection for its crew. It features modular composite armor, allowing for quick replacement and adaptation to different threat levels. The tank's front has especially thick armor, and the engine's placement at the front adds an additional layer of protection. In addition to its physical armor, the Makava is equipped with the Trophy Active Protection System, the only fully operational and combat-proven APS against anti-tank guided missiles in the world. The Trophy APS was developed by Israel's Rafael Advanced Defense Systems and Israel Aircraft Industries ELTA Group. Designed to detect and neutralize incoming projectiles, the Trophy system is equipped with four radar antennas and fire control radars to track incoming threats such as anti-tank guided missiles, ATGMs, and rocket-propelled grenades. Once a projectile is detected, the Trophy system fires a shotgun-type blast to neutralize the threat. The tank also features NBC, Nuclear Biological Chemical Protection, helping ensure the crew's safety in a variety of threat environments. When compared to other modern main battle tanks like the M1 Abrams, Leopard 2, or T-90, the Makava holds its ground in terms of technological capabilities and protection. While it may not have the same speed as some of its counterparts, its emphasis on crew safety and its advanced fire control system make it a formidable opponent on the battlefield. The Makava's modular armor and active protection system give it an edge in survivability, something that is paramount in Israeli military doctrine. While tanks like the M1 Abrams have mostly comparable armor and weaponry, the Makava's unique design features and adaptations for infantry support make it more versatile. The combination of advanced fire control, robust armor, and superior protection systems has a profound impact on the Makava's combat effectiveness. 
The high accuracy of its weaponry ensures that it can engage and neutralize threats at long distances, while its armor and protection systems significantly reduce the vulnerability of the tank and its crew. The tank's design prioritizing crew safety means that even if the tank is disabled in combat, the crew has a higher chance of survival, ensuring experienced and trained soldiers can continue to contribute to the defense forces. Furthermore, the integration of systems supporting infantry operations makes the Makava a versatile asset on the battlefield, capable of fulfilling multiple roles beyond that of a traditional main battle tank. In essence, the technologies integrated into the Makava tank have proven crucial in its operational success and effectiveness in combat, reflecting a balanced approach to firepower, protection, and mobility. This has not only established the Makava as a key component of Israel's military might, but also as a prominent example of modern tank design focused on multidimensional warfare and crew safety. Historically, this strong emphasis on crew protection has paid dividends. The tank's front is especially well protected, featuring thick layers of armor and the engine placed at the front, providing an additional protective barrier for the crew. This unconventional design choice ensures that even in the event of a frontal attack, the crew compartment remains shielded. To enhance its mine protection, the Makava's floor is reinforced, and the tank employs a special suspension system designed to mitigate the impact of explosions. These features collectively make the Makava one of the best protected tanks in the world against anti-tank missiles and mine blasts. Another important aspect of the Makava's design is its rear compartment, which can be used to transport additional troops or carry supplies. This space, situated behind the tank's turret, can accommodate up to six infantry soldiers, allowing the Makava to function as an armored personnel carrier in addition to its role as a main battle tank. This design feature greatly enhances the tank's versatility on the battlefield, providing additional support to ground forces and contributing to the tank's overall effectiveness in combat operations. The Makava has a proven track record of surviving attacks in various combat situations, primarily due to these exceptional design and protection features. There have been numerous instances, particularly in conflicts with Hezbollah and during operations in the Gaza Strip, where Makava tanks have survived direct hits from anti-tank missiles and IEDs, sometimes with the crew members walking away with minimal or no injuries. This has also resulted in comparatively lighter losses of both tanks and personnel. During the 1982 Israeli-Lebanese war, for instance, Israel lost dozens of tanks, but only a tiny percentage of those were Makavas. Even during the 2006 war with Hezbollah, which fired more than 1,000 anti-tank missiles throughout the conflict, the losses of Makavas were far more limited than older armor. In total, five Makava tanks were destroyed. Of these, two were Makava Mark IV. One was damaged by an IED, and the other was destroyed by a Russian AT-14 Cornet missile. The Israeli military said that it was satisfied with the Makava Mark IV performance and attributed most of the problems to insufficient training before the war. In total, 50 Makava tanks, mostly Makava IIs and Threes, were hit, eight of which remained immediately serviceable on the battlefield. The Makava experienced even more success during Israel's 2014 war with Hamas, as no Makava tanks were even damaged during the conflict. The Mark IV versions, fitted with the Trophy Active Protection System, reportedly intercepted dozens of anti-tank missiles and RPGs during the ground operation, mostly Russian-made Cornet models, proving to many that it was extraordinarily effective against man-portable anti-tank weapons. However, this is not always the case, and like any battle tank, the Makava is not invincible. This is especially true in today's technologically advanced combat environments. As the war in Ukraine has demonstrated, small drones with explosives attached to them can be deadly to tanks. This is even true for models as well armored and advanced as the Makava. As part of its infiltration of southern Israel on October 7th and subsequent murder and abduction of hundreds of Israelis and foreigners, Hamas fighters struck Israeli outposts along the 40-mile border wall separating Israel from the Gaza Strip. Makava tanks have patrolled the border for decades, meant to stop just such an incursion. But this time, some of them came under attack by Hamas's grenade-dropping drones. Hamas videos depict multiple successful strikes on Merkava Mark IVs. In at least two cases, the tanks also burned, showing just how deadly explosive drones can be to armor unprepared for a precision strike from above. At first glance, many speculated that the drone's grenades, which weigh only a couple of pounds, penetrated the thin top armor on the Makava's turrets. In general, that's how Ukrainian and Russian drones have been destroying each other's tanks in such large numbers. 
but later experts analyzed the videos of Hamas drone strikes on Makavas. In both, it seems the drone's grenades struck either the engine compartment in the front of the tank's hull or the ammunition stowage in the bustle hanging from the back of the turret. Such strikes show the limitations of increasing tank durability. Even though the Makava has some of the most durable top turret armor in the world, not every area of the tank can be so well protected, and a top-down strike on the front of the hull at best destroys the tank's engine and immobilizes it. A strike on the back of the turret, on the bustle, tends to ignite the ammo stored there. So as military analyst David Axe recently noted, a top-down strike on the front of the hull at best destroys the tank's engines and immobilizes it. A strike on the back of the turret, on the bustle, tends to ignite the ammo stored there. But the ensuing secondary explosion occurs outside the turret, not inside where the crew is. All that is to say, the Makava is better protected from top-down drone attacks than other tank types are. It's not invulnerable, of course, but a drone strike on a Makava is far more likely to immobilize the tank and spare the crew than it is to take out both the tank and the crew. Yet Israel is also clearly concerned about the possibility of a direct strike on the tank hatch. In the days since Hamas's attack, videos have emerged of Makavas being modified with so-called cope cages, hardened protective screens, which the Russians began to adopt in 2022 to try and stop Ukrainian ATGM strikes. This again points to the role of the war in Ukraine, which has heavily influenced modern combat doctrine and technology in what several experts have called a modern war laboratory. Numerous militaries around the world have watched and attempted to learn from different aspects of the conflict, including how to avoid the fate of Russia, which has lost upwards of 5,000 tanks. For the IDF, losing multiple Makavas in a matter of days seems to have acted as a wake-up call. Mark Kantian, a senior advisor with the Center for Strategic and International Studies, told the Washington Post that, My assumption is that the Hamas attacks gave Israel the impetus to install the cages more widely. It's probably something that they had been thinking about before since everyone is watching the war in Ukraine so closely. One major question is how effective cope cages will actually be against Hamas drone operators. Samuel Bendet, a drone expert at the Center for Naval Analyses, has pointed out that the effectiveness of extra shielding like this on a tank varies wildly, depending on the type of drone being used. They are generally more effective against quadcopters that drop small munitions, like the drones Hamas used in the attacks against Israeli forces. They are less useful against cheaply made racing drones that are more maneuverable. Such weapons have been used more and more recently to target Russia's Wagner mercenaries in Sudan. A talented pilot, Bendet said, can get around the gaps in the cages and armor, but it's still unclear whether Hamas has acquired such technology, known as first-person view or FPV drones. If it has, whether through Iran or other channels, it's likely to pose a significant challenge to Israel's armored divisions, especially in a dense urban environment like Gaza. Similarly, the protective screens would be of limited use against weapons like rocket-propelled grenades, if fired down on Israeli vehicles from high buildings within Gaza. Sonny Butterworth, a senior analyst at the defense intelligence firm Jane's, noted that shields act as a buffer intended to prematurely detonate an explosive, disable warheads used on some rocket-propelled grenades, or, in the case of drone-drop grenades, cause the weapon to simply roll off the vehicle before it strikes weaker armor or fall into an open hatch. None of this solves the problem of fast-moving, pinpoint drone strikes, as any attack with sufficient accuracy will still be able to hit the least armored area of a tank. Even the much-lauded trophy system will fare, as it's likely that the tanks Hamas destroyed in its surprise attack did not have the protection system active. In sum, it's always worth remembering that due to the changing nature of modern warfare, even the best defenses in the world are not a guarantee. But while the Merkava Mark IV still has weaknesses against skilled or technologically adept anti-tank fire, so does every other modern armored vehicle. And there is little doubt that pound for pound, the Merkava remains among the most powerful and sophisticated tanks in the world, with a terrifying reputation among nations. Yet, only time will tell if its array of advanced features and firepower will stand up to the challenges of asymmetric warfare in the 21st century. What do you think? Just how powerful and relevant is the Merkava on today's battlefield? Let us know your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. Putin has been targeting Ukrainian cities and its civilians since the beginning of the Russo-Ukrainian war, and recently it's gotten worse. President Volodymyr Zelensky has been upgrading Ukraine's air defense system as quickly and efficiently as possible. But here's the problem. Air defense is super expensive and supply of ammunition is limited. Thankfully, Ukraine's Western allies are on it. 
Germany recently announced it would be resupplying Ukraine with 45 Gepard or Cheetah anti-aircraft tanks by the end of the year to aid in its defensive struggle against Putin. These tanks are designed to destroy low-flying targets and are much cheaper to operate than other air defense systems like the US-made Patriot. Will they be able to protect Ukraine's critical infrastructure and civilian targets from Putin's missiles and drones? Ever wondered why Putin is targeting civilians in the first place? Here's the thing. In parallel with Ukraine's growing battlefield dominance, Russia has had a more difficult time attacking Ukrainian military units. One of the few ways that Putin has chosen to fight back has been to launch massive and continual waves of missile and drone attacks at Ukrainian cities. It cannot be understated how villainous these attacks have been. According to the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights OHCHR, estimates, over 9,000 Ukrainian civilians have been killed as of June 2023, and more than 15,000 wounded from these and other Russian attacks. Those numbers, though tragic, are dwarfed by Ukraine's own estimates. They say that the civilian death toll in the invasion so far is closer to 100,000 killed, more than 10 times the official number released by the United Nations. For their part, the UN has admitted that the real numbers of civilian casualties will undoubtedly be higher than what they can confirm. Many of these deaths have come from the thousands of missiles and drones that Russia has used to target Ukrainian civilian targets, both infrastructure such as elements of their electrical grid, as well as apartment buildings, hospitals, shopping areas and schools. As of early July 2023, Brigadier General Oleksiy Romov, Deputy Chief of the General Staff of Ukraine, reported that close to 5,000 missiles have been fired at Ukraine, with almost 3,500 of those strikes carried out on populated areas. To be able to defend themselves from such attacks, Ukraine has received some of the best Western-made surface-to-air missile systems, including at least two batteries of the very capable US-built Patriot missile systems which have helped protect Ukraine's capital Kyiv from advanced Russian ballistic missiles. A third battery has been promised by the Netherlands, but its arrival is not expected until later in 2023. The challenge of using the Patriot system is in reserving its expensive missiles to shoot down the more advanced and harder-to-target Russian missiles. Ukraine can't use their Patriot batteries to shoot down every missile and drone that Russia launches, and Russia has been relying more and more on the much cheaper, Iranian-made Shahed-136 drone which costs a fraction of the $4 million per missile that a Patriot battery fires. Estimates are that the Shahed-136 drones currently being deployed by Russia cost as little as $20,000 to make, even using other surface-to-air missiles like Ukraine's Soviet-era S-300 SAM systems and fighter-launched interceptor missiles can cost Ukraine between $140,000 and $500,000 per launch. In just one night, July 7, 2023, Russia launched 18 Shahed drones from the city of Primorsk Aktarsk in the region of Krasnodar Krai. Ukrainian defenses managed to destroy 12 of the drones, but six still got through. Because of the vast numbers and lower costs of some of Russia's attacking drones, Ukraine has had to make use of less expensive systems to shoot down these attackers. One of the best responses to these attacks has been the use of an overlooked piece of military hardware, one that's been discontinued by its original manufacturer as being too out of date for the fast-paced environment of modern warfare, but which has still made a huge impact on the Ukrainian battlefield, and has been responsible for saving hundreds, if not thousands of lives, the 1960s-era Gepard self-propelled anti-aircraft system from Germany. Let's take a look at why this Cold War-era piece of military hardware was and still is a total badass. Here's how it started. Anticipating a possible war between NATO and the Soviet Union, Germany began development of the Gepard, the German word for cheetah, in the late 1960s based on the hull of the Leopard 1 main battle tank. The initial design requirements were for a mobile anti-aircraft system to counter low-flying Soviet fighter bombers. Drones hadn't even been anticipated back then, but fleets of Soviet ground attack aircraft were definitely considered a threat. Between the beginning of production in 1973 and the late 1980s, when the Gepard was discontinued in favor of more advanced designs, Germany built 420 hulls and about 430 turrets. The Gepard is equipped with a pair of quick-firing Erlikon 35mm cannons, which can each fire 550 rounds per minute. Putting a stream of lead like this into the sky has been an effective way of countering the Shahed drones, and their lower overall cost per system, compared to other more expensive SAM systems like the Patriot or S-300, means Ukraine can deploy more and more of them over a wider area of the country. 
providing air defenses to smaller cities like the recently struck Lviv. One of the reasons the Gepard can defeat these drones is because of their integrated radar systems, which have a reported range of more than 10 miles. Designed to track Soviet-era fighters and bombers, they work even better against the more sluggish Iranian drones. The Gepard can fire a variety of ammunition, including armor-piercing discarding Sabot tracer rounds, high-explosive incendiary tracer rounds, and advanced hit efficiency and destruction rounds. Depending on the ammunition they're firing, Gepard cannons can hit targets more than three and a half miles away. Ukraine began using the first Gepards around August of 2022. They were first reported officially on the Ukrainian Weapons Tracker Twitter account on August 25th, though they may have been in the country earlier and just not officially acknowledged before then. As of June 2023, Germany has sent at least 34 Gepards to Ukraine and has agreed to send another 15 more in the coming weeks. Germany has promised a further 30 Gepards will be delivered before the end of the year. In addition, other countries that have bought Gepards in the past from Germany are in talks to send more of the systems, including Jordan, which operates around 40 Gepards. As soon as the Gepards were in country, they were rushed to the front lines almost immediately and proved effective at downing low-flying Russian cruise missiles and drones. They have been particularly effective against the Shahed 131 and 136 drones that Russia has been using against Ukraine's civilian population and their energy infrastructure. Because of the relative simplicity of the system, Ukrainian crews have been able to successfully operate the Gepard after only two months of training, compared to the German standard of 18 months. One crew around Odessa reportedly downed 10 Shahed drones and two cruise missiles in a single day. Inexpensive and simple-to-operate anti-aircraft systems like the Gepards bridge an important gap in Ukraine's air defenses, which includes long-range systems like the Soviet-era S-300 and Buck surface-to-air missile systems, as well as Western-made systems like NASAMS, a jointly produced mid-range air defense system made by the US firm Raytheon and Norway's Kongsberg Defense and Aerospace, along with the previously mentioned US-built Patriot batteries. Missiles fired by those systems are more advanced, but those advances come at a much higher price, and their construction takes much longer to build. These two constraints mean that the missiles used by these systems are relatively few in number. Those advanced missiles are also Ukraine's main defense against Russia's fast, high-flying fighters and bombers, and their high-tech caliber cruise missile. Ukrainian forces can't afford to use them against every drone and cruise missile. Because Gepards are designed to destroy low-flying targets and the ammunition is much cheaper, they can engage the drones and missiles for which the more expensive systems aren't a good match. There's only one problem with Ukraine's use of the Gepards. The ammunition is made by the gun's manufacturer, the Swiss company Erlikon. But Switzerland, attempting to maintain its neutrality, has so far been reluctant to allow ammunition to be sold to Ukraine. As of May 2023, the Swiss were still blocking a proposed sale of Gepard ammunition by Germany to Ukraine. As the producer of that ammunition, Switzerland has the right to oversee any sales of that ammunition by countries that have bought it from them. But Norway, newly accepted into NATO, has indicated that it might be willing to send some of their ammunition to Ukraine, while Germany has indicated they might be able to create a new production line to create the ammunition inside their country, with Switzerland's permission, thus bypassing Switzerland's concerns about their neutrality. More recently, some cracks have begun to appear in Switzerland's icy freeze on supplying lethal aid to Ukraine. In early May 2023, the two houses of the Swiss parliament voted to amend the Military Materials Act to allow the transfer of military equipment to Ukraine in the future. This may allow not just the sale of Gepard ammunition, but the possible transfer of some of Switzerland's German-made Leopard 2 tanks as well. In the meantime, Ukraine's allies have been able to source ammunition from other countries. Germany has reportedly acquired ammunition from a Norwegian supplier, since Germany had itself only around 60,000 shells in the opening months of the invasion. The US has also found a new source of both the Gepards and its ammunition from the country of Jordan. The US paid an intermediary, Global Military Products Incorporated of Tampa, Florida, to purchase some of Jordan's Gepards, which may have originally come from the Netherlands. These behind-the-scenes wheeling and dealing should keep Ukraine well supplied with both the systems and the ammo needed to operate them, at least until either Switzerland relents and allows the sale of the ammo to proceed or when a new manufacturing plant for the ammunition is established outside of Switzerland's borders. Ukrainian data shows that in May 2023, Russia attacked Ukraine with a record monthly total of more than 300 drones, 
nearly all of them Iranian Shahed-type drones. But by the end of July, that number may be eclipsed, as Russia is ramping up its use of the low-cost attack weapon. On June 2nd, Ukraine managed to shoot down 36 Russian missiles and drones in and around the capital of Kyiv overnight, with two people injured by falling debris from the intercepted weapons. To counter this growing threat, Ukraine is working on more technologically advanced methods to stop them, from jamming their targeting systems to intercepting them with defending drones. To provide an idea of how quickly Ukraine is reacting to the drone threat, there were seven companies able to sell drones to the country's military soon after Russia's invasion began. By July of 2023, that number had risen to 40. And by the end of 2023, the number of Ukrainian companies able to produce military drones, both offensive and defensive, will reach 50. But as promising as these new efforts are, a reliable version of their products may be months or years away. For right now, one of the best options Ukraine has available to it is the Gepard. It's already a low-cost platform, it's been a proven drone defeater, and it's available in good numbers right now. The more Gepards Ukraine can purchase or have donated to them from other countries, the better off their cities and their people will be. So what do you think? Will the Gepards be able to protect from Putin's drones until Ukraine builds up its counteroffensive? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Russia recently lost the biggest tank battle of the entire war in Ukraine. Could it mean the beginning of Putin's defeat? This bloody battle over the small coal mining town of Vuladar was part of the still ongoing struggle over the larger Donbass region. Vuladar lies about 40 miles southeast of the city of Donetsk, near the pre-invasion line which divided Ukraine from the self-declared Donetsk People's Republic. And since the start of the year, Vuladar has become a killing field for Russian armor, with the largest tank battle of the entire war taking place there over the span of three weeks. In that time alone, Russia lost over 130 tanks and armored vehicles, forcing Putin to rely on mass infantry assaults to try and retake the position. This was a serious blow, especially since tank warfare has been heavily mythologized in Russia since World War II, and has also become symbolic of the broader conflict in Ukraine. And the Battle of Volodar showed yet again that the Russian military has some massive issues that won't be fixed anytime soon. Volodar. Even the name itself has got a kind of Lord of the Rings dark and creepy ring to it. And with good reason. Here's why. While Volodar has been the site of small clashes and shelling since the start of the invasion, the main battle for the town began on January 24th, 2023. That night, Russia began launching assaults on Ukrainian positions, which would quickly turn into a devastating three-week siege demonstrating Russian failures. At that point, Ukraine was still waiting for sophisticated Western tanks, like the US Abrams and German Leopard 2, to arrive. Russia's replacement armor showed up earlier, but during its first deployment in Volodar, it got absolutely decimated. Without superior firepower this time round, Ukrainians were forced to rely once again on strategy and tactics. Much of the three weeks took on the same pattern, pitched tank battles along dirt roads and tree lines, with Russians trying to thrust forward in columns and Ukrainians firing on them from hidden defensive positions. If this sounds familiar, it might be because Russia took the same terrible approach when trying to take Kyiv last year, costing them hundreds of tanks. Clearly, Russian commanders didn't learn much from that catastrophe and made exactly the same mistake this time around advancing their unprotected tank columns into ambushes. So how did this latest embarrassment for Putin play out? Because the terrain around Vuladar is hard to defend, consisting mostly of flat, open plains and light woods, it is hardly ideal for stopping a major assault. But Ukrainians used the terrain to their advantage and applied doctrines of combined arms warfare, which Russian war planners clearly haven't picked up on. The key to Ukraine's victory in the Battle of Volodar was enforcing Russia to fight on their terms. This meant limiting the battlefield and forcing Russian troops to attack where Ukraine wanted them to. To do so, the Ukrainian military placed hundreds of tanks and anti-personnel mines in the fields outside of Volodar. Due to the flat landscape and lack of cover, any Russian minesweepers were immediately targeted with artillery fire. But Ukrainian troops didn't just put mines everywhere. Instead, they left clear corridors between the minefields, only large enough for two or three Russian tanks at a time to roll through. If the tanks moved at all from the cleared path, they risked having their treads blown off, 
leaving them totally exposed to artillery strikes. But rather than try an alternate approach to get around the mines, Russian commanders made one of the most basic mistakes in all of warfare, attacking exactly where their enemy wanted them to. When Russian commanders ordered their tanks into battle along these unmined paths outside Vladar, it left them incredibly vulnerable to the same ambushes Ukrainians have employed since the start of the invasion. Hiding in covered positions near the tank columns, Ukrainian hunter-killer teams set up anti-tank missiles on both sides of the kill zone. Without triggering the anti-tank mines, these teams were able to cross the minefields and dig themselves into strategic positions, often hiding in bushes or abandoned buildings. From there they could fire and retreat with little fear of being hit by tank fire. The main tools Ukraine employed for this stage of the ambush were the domestically produced Stogna P and the American-made Javelin, both deadly anti-tank missiles or ATGMs. Sometimes called the Skiff, the Stogna P is a less advanced system, but can still pack a serious punch against unlucky tanks. The Stogna is somewhat clunky, weighing about 60 pounds, and relies on manual guidance, requiring its operator to maintain line of sight on the target while the missile is still in flight. But even with these limitations, the Stugna has shown it can be deadly, with a range of up to 3 miles and tandem high-explosive anti-tank or high-explosive fragmentary warheads capable of penetrating modern composite tank armor. The Javelin has proven to be even more successful at obliterating Russian tanks. Manufactured by American defense giants Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, the Javelin has an effective range of more than 8,000 feet and employs a fire-and-forget targeting system, allowing its operator to flee to safety after firing. Once in flight, the Javelin's missile locks onto the infrared signature of its target and flies in one of two flight modes, top attack or direct attack. While its direct attack mode is similar to the Stugna, the Javelin's top attack mode has proven to be the most deadly against Russian tanks. In this configuration, the missile travels in a high arc coming down on the top of the least protected section of the tank, just above its barrel. Like the Stugna, the Javelin also features a tandem warhead charge, using a smaller initial blast to penetrate hundreds of millimeters of armor, while the second charge creates a cone of superplastically deformed metal, which can shred the inside of a tank like paper. Both of these ATGM systems were put to good use outside of Vladar. Among these responsible was Lieutenant Vladislav Bayek, the deputy commander of Ukraine's 1st Mechanized Battalion of the 72nd Brigade, which inflicted much of the damage on Russian armor. Working out of a bunker in Vladar, Lieutenant Bayek used a drone to spot the first column of 15 Russian tanks and armored personnel vehicles. We were ready, he said. We knew something like this would happen. The Russian officers, meanwhile, clearly did not. Lieutenant Bayak waited until the tanks were strung out between the mined fields before ordering a lightning ambush with the command to battle. Stugna and Javelin operators hiding in the tree lines along the fields opened fire, as did hidden artillery positions further from the road, using American M777 and French Caesar howitzers. Each team was assigned a different section of the Russian column to fire on, focusing on the front and back vehicles first to create a bottleneck. The result was devastating. Tanks in the column attempted to turn and escape the ambush, only to blow up on the mine-laden shoulder of the road. In turn, each destroyed vehicle made it harder for the rest of the column to escape, with blown-up vehicles forming their own roadblock. At that point, Ukrainian artillery would open fire on the trapped tanks, killing the Russians who tried to flee from their trapped vehicles. It ended in obliteration. For three weeks, this pattern repeated itself with Russia losing more and more tanks and, incredibly, refusing to change tactics. At one point, Russian tanks became so stuck that Ukrainians were even able to call in a strike by a HIMARS rocket system, usually only effective against stationary targets like ammunition depots. Ukraine also made excellent use of its own older tanks as well. Because they couldn't outgun the Russian armor head-on, Ukrainians dug their tanks into hidden defensive positions. Some were concealed with bushes and camouflage netting, while others were actually buried in the soil, leaving only their turrets. While not effective against top-attack munitions, these dug-in defensive positions dramatically increased the survivability of Ukraine's tanks from head-on fire. And because Ukrainians knew exactly where the Russian tank columns would advance, they were able to range the entire approach for their hidden tanks and artillery. This allowed them to make strikes onto predetermined firing points with high levels of accuracy 
and not waste their limited ammunition. During each ambush, Ukrainian tank crews also used a range of extremely clever tactics to problem-solve and avoid having their positions detected. The tanks couldn't wait with their engines turned on without giving themselves away through thermal signature or engine noise, but needed to stay warm to be quickly fired up for combat. So Ukrainians placed kerosene-burning heaters next to their engines to keep the tanks ready to go on a moment's notice. Similarly, their hidden positions meant that many Ukrainian tank crews did not have a line of sight to their targets, so they improvised by using drone operators to sight in their attacks. This also added an extra level of confusion for the already bewildered Russian forces, as their front lines were pummeled with unseen tank fire. Their own tanks couldn't locate where to return fire, leaving them essentially blind and helpless. If the Russian columns managed to escape the mines, ATGMs, artillery, and hidden tank positions, Ukraine just used drones to shift their firing positions to fleeing troops and vehicles. And for any tanks that actually managed to retreat back through the kill zone, Ukraine had yet another deadly surprise waiting. In one of its recent shipments of military aid, the United States supplied Ukraine with up to 10,000 specially modified 155mm artillery shells, each filled with nine individual anti-tank mines and a magnetic detonator. Known as Remote Anti-Armor Mine Systems, or RAMs, these terrifying weapons were used to mop up any surviving Russian tanks. When a fleeing column would exit the rear of the kill zone, another group of hidden Ukrainian gunners opened fire on their rear, once again trapping them with a rain of anti-tank mines. By employing this strategy again and again against Russians who refused to try other approaches, you can see how Ukrainian defenders destroyed over 100 tanks and armored vehicles in a matter of weeks around Volodar. After a few successful ambushes, it also became clear to Ukrainian commanders that the Russians are running out of experienced tank crews and commanders alike. One Russian tank commander captured outside of Volodar turned out to be a medic, who had been given a brief crash course and then sent to the front lines. Because successfully operating even an older tank takes several months of specialized training, there was little chance that the former medic would do anything but get himself killed or captured. And this wasn't a one-off, but a repeating pattern, with almost every Russian officer captured near Volodar having little to no experience in battle. And incredibly, the tank crews these officers were commanding appeared to be even greener. Most were made up of recent conscripts who had, at best, a passing familiarity with whatever vehicle they were operating. This astonishing lack of qualified personnel, while far from surprising, is yet another sign that the Russian war effort is falling apart. Russia lost nearly all of its experienced tank crews during the spring of 2022, during the disastrous assault on Kyiv. The limited number who survived those early ambushes were sent back to the east of the country as Putin limited his war effort. But those survivors were once again decimated during the wildly successful Ukrainian counteroffensive last fall. During that period, the most elite of Russia's remaining tank units, the First Guards Tank Army, was nearly destroyed outside the northern city of Liman. This was the best trained and equipped Russian tank force operating in Ukraine and was supposed to easily hold captured territory. Considering that even this elite unit was not up to the task, it's no surprise that the green Russian troops sent to Volodar have fared so badly. This is a sharp contrast with Ukrainian forces, many of whom were green and terrified when they were drafted or volunteered to defend their country last February. Even though many of those defending Volodar were relatively recent recruits, they learned on the go and didn't make the same mistake twice. Most of Ukraine's most experienced tank crews are currently elsewhere in Eastern Europe, learning to operate the advanced Leopard 2 and M1 Abrams tanks. Yet even the relatively untested troops defending Volodar were able to pull off another staggering victory. This is a pretty clear indication that the war has decisively turned in Ukraine's favor, both in terms of equipment and personnel. It's also yet another reminder of just how poor Russian military doctrine and planning is turning out to be, as neither field officers nor top military brass seem able to learn from past mistakes. Part of this difficulty likely comes from the very structure of the Russian military, which is made up of multiple, independently commanded parts. This lack of a unified command structure has plagued Russia for years and appears to be at least part of the reason why new conscripts are not warned against walking into obvious ambushes. Similarly, the seasoned troops which should theoretically be spearheading such an assault appear to be in much worse shape than expected. 
A recent intelligence report from the UK found that Russia sent another elite unit, the 155th Naval Infantry Brigade, into the fighting around Vladar. This force is supposed to be among the deadliest in Russia and was utilized in the largest battles last year. But the 155th suffered so many losses that even before Vladar, it was on its third personnel restaffing since the start of the war. As a result, this supposedly first-class fighting force is now staffed mostly by fresh recruits. Adding to the dysfunction is the fact that the 155th was apparently not being sent into combat together, but instead broken up into smaller units and integrated with other commands. Rather than the desired effect of boosting other units' battle readiness, the decision simply made the 155th entirely ineffective. It certainly doesn't help that Russia is rapidly running out of precision-guided munitions and other war supplies. As a result, Russian forces were unable to eliminate the Ukrainian artillery and ATGM positions before their assault on Vladar, assuming they could force their way into the town regardless. Another reason behind Russia's repeated failures in Vladar and elsewhere relates to its heavy use of private military contractors, or PMCs. The most notorious of these is the Wagner Group, headed by Putin confidant Yevgeny Prigozhin. Putin's reliance on Wagner and other groups, as well as the rampant corruption in Russia, has led to a scenario where each is directly competing for the spoils of war. Vladar is near two massive coal mines, one of the main reasons why Russia has spent so much time and blood trying to take the town. But since its resources would only likely be given to one PMC, there is a strong incentive to fight over spoils. So at Vladar, the official Russian military, the Wagner Group, and the Patriot PMC, controlled directly by Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu, have all been competing to make the town their own. As a consequence, none of these groups shared information over the potential ambushes, each hoping that the other would take most of the casualties, leaving them free to take over and plunder the town. Controlling the near 70 million tons of coal underneath Vladar would make either Prigozhin or Shoigu far wealthier than they currently are, giving them a billion-dollar reason not to cooperate. Of course, this dynamic isn't great for an effective fighting force and has left Russia at a significant information disadvantage. There's another political dimension to Russia's failure in Vladar as well. It's clear to pretty much everyone but the Russians that the smart move would have been to move elsewhere and avoid the potential of mines and ambushes. Yet Russian commanders have insisted on bizarre pitched assaults, possibly because of Putin's desperate need for a political win. Anywhere Russian forces have been ground to a halt, the political importance of not appearing to lose a battle has come to outweigh the strategic importance of withdrawing and maneuvering around static defenses. Doing so would be yet another signal of weakness, especially to Putin's most hardline supporters of the invasion. But even so, after the staggering loss at Vladar, cracks are starting to show. Russian military bloggers of vocally pro-war group have fiercely criticized the endless failed tank assaults. Grey Zone, a telegram channel close to the Wagner Group, posted in early March that relatives of the dead are inclined almost to murder and blood revenge against the general who was in charge at Vladar. And while the Ukrainian armed forces can be glad of Russia's staggering incompetence, we should never forget the terrible price paid by places like Vladar. By the end of the Russian assault in February, the town's deputy mayor stated that Vladar was destroyed, with 100% of the buildings damaged. Of the town's original population of 15,000, less than 500 remain mostly squatting in ruins and collecting rainwater to drink. While there is no doubt that the battle was a tactical victory for Ukraine, it will also take many, many years before anything can be rebuilt. In any case, it is more than clear that the war's trajectory has changed in Ukraine's favor and that Russia cannot suffer too many more defeats like this one. But what do you think? Was Vladar a turning point in the war? And will Russia's repeated failures eventually doom Putin's ambitions? Let us know what you think in the comment section below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis.